Juratan sat in a cave, thinking about how bloody cold it was. Even his wolf, Sharptooth, was shivering, whilst snuggling so close to its master that it was almost trying to burrow underneath him. It was odd, really. Juratan, chieftain of the Frost Wolf clan, had spent most of his life in the cold. You'd think he'd be used to it by now. But this wasn't his home. This was some alien world. Plus, his entire clan had been exiled from the Horde, so maybe that was another reason why this place bothered him so much. A little snuffling sound from within the cave then caused Joritan to turn, and his harsh face, wrinkled from years of worry and anger, softened somewhat. His son, as yet unnamed, was making stupid baby noises whilst being fed. Joritan then rose and made his way towards his family, and watched as his wife Draka did a bit of boob feeding, and for a brief moment, that beautiful natural sight made him forget all of his worries, before they all came flooding back again and he sat down, sighing deeply. We have a child now. Yes. A fine, strong son. One that will lead the Frostwolf clan after his father dies nobly in battle, many years from now. I have a responsibility for his future. Draka didn't interrupt, but she knew where this was going. She knew her mate far too well. Had I not spoken against Gul'dan, our son would have more playmates with which to grow up. We'd continue to be valued members of the Horde. And you would not have been the mate I joined with. Juratan of the Frostwolf clan would not sit by and let our people be led to their deaths. With what you learned, you had to speak out. Juratan nodded. To know that Gul'dan had no love for our people. And it was nothing more than a way for him to increase his own power. And then he fell silent, as he could feel the rage building up inside him again. Gul'dan, what a prick. I spoke, and we were exiled. It's a great dishonor. Only Gul'dan's dishonor. Your people are alive and free, Juratan. This is a harsh place, yes, but we have plenty of fresh meat. We can survive. They deserve more. He deserves more. Juratan then rose up and straightened to his full imposing height. There were some who heeded me. I will return and find those chieftains. Convince them of the truth of my story. We shall no longer be slaves of Gul'dan. This I swear. Why, you won't go alone. We shall come with you. What? No. I forbid it. <laughs> I am Draka, daughter of Kelkar, son of Rakish. No one forbids me to follow my mate. Not even Juratan himself. I stand by you. Some amount of time later, Juratan, Draka, Baby and Wolf arrived at the field camp of another chieftain. One Orgrim Doomhammer. I regret that I place you and your clan in jeopardy. If word reached Gul'dan that the Blackrock clan were entertaining such guests, they too would be exiled. But Orgrim didn't give a shit. If death is to come for us, it'll find us behaving with honour. Doomhammer then escorted them into a tent and provided them with food and drink and stuff. And once they were all settled, Orgrim then attempted to make some small talk by pointing at the baby and saying, A fine strong boy. He will make a fitting leader someday. But we did not come all this way for you to admire my son. You spoke with veiled words many years ago. I wished to protect my clan. I was not certain my suspicions were correct until Gul'dan imposed the exile. Listen, my old friend, and then you must judge for yourself. And so, in soft tones so that nearby guards didn't overhear, Juratan then told Doomhammer everything he knew. The bargain with the Demon Lord, the obscene nature of Gul'dan's power, the betrayal of the clans through the Shadow Council, all of the things. Doomhammer listened, forcing his face to remain impassive. However, deep in his chest, his heart was absolutely pounding. Juratan then finished his explanation, and there was an awkward silence for a bit, until... I believe you, old friend. I can assure you, I do not stand for Gul'dan's plans for our people. We will stand with you against this darkness. The look of relief and gratitude on Juratan's face was palpable. He immediately extended a hand and did a little bro shake with his bezzy. Unfortunately, you can't stay here, though it would be an honour to have you do so. One of my personal guards will escort you to a safe place. I will do what I can on your behalf, and when the time is right, you and I shall stand side by side and slay the betrayer Gul'dan together. Doomhammer's personal guard said absolutely nothing as he led Juratan and his family out of the encampment and into some nearby woods, but soon enough, they arrived at a secluded and verdant clearing. I knew Orgrim could be trusted. It will not be long before. However, the Frostwolf Chieftain froze mid-sentence. Something was wrong. A nearby snap of a twig 
was enough for him to reach for his weapon, but the intruders were upon him in an instant. They'd moved so silently and quickly, it took Juratan a few moments to realise he'd already been wounded, with a bloody great axe gash in his leg. A brief sharp howl filled the air, followed by more silence. They'd taken out Sharptooth effortlessly. Whoever these attackers were, they weren't behaving like good honest orcs. These were assassins. But the thought of his son gave Juratan enough strength to fight, despite the severed artery in his leg. He picked himself up through sheer adrenaline and surged forward, grabbing a nearby figure by the throat and squeezing hard until he heard a satisfying snap. Juratan then turned to find his next target, only to be met with a sight that instantly destroyed him. Draka, hacked to pieces, lying in a pool of her own blood. Juratan knew he didn't stand a chance, grievously wounded and emotionally distraught as he was. He knew he was about to die. There was no point in trying to defend himself. So, instead, he rushed towards the small bundle that was his baby. However, his wounds and blood loss chose that moment to be too much for him, causing him to collapse to the ground before he could reach it. Please, take the child. Your child will be left for the forest creatures. You can watch as they tear it to pieces. And with that, the assassins were gone, leaving as silently as they'd appeared, and Juratan lay still, unable to move, staring with failing eyesight at the image of his son, until everything went black, because he was dead. By the light, what a mess. 22-year-old Tamis Foxton emerged from the woods, a little bit taken aback by the sight of two dead orcs, a dead wolf and a whole bunch of blood. This was not what he'd expected to find whilst following the extremely annoying shrieking noise. Hey, Lieutenant. I guess that's what's been making this damnable racket. Another figure emerged, one Aedalus Blackmore. I've never seen a well before. That's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. The Lieutenant gave the little orc baby a nudge with his foot, which I shall just describe instead of showing because I'm pretty sure animating a baby being kicked is a bad idea. Now, Aedalus had already downed at least one bottle of booze, but his mind was still sharp enough to form an idea. So he picked up the little monster, and almost immediately, it stopped crying. Interesting. Her infants have blue eyes, just as humans do. Mr. Thomas, did you know that you have the honour to serve a brilliant man? Of course, sir. But, uh, why is that relevant right now? Because, my dear boy, I'm holding in my hands something that's going to make me very famous, very wealthy, and best of all, very, 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 and powerful. Adolus felt pretty proud of himself for the next few days. He was indeed a brilliant man. In recent times, orcs were proving less and less of a challenge. Men used to the excitement of daily battles were starting to grow a little bit bored. Blackmore had put on a few fights for entertainment, giving people an outlet for their pent-up energies, as well as an opportunity to make a bit of gold. But this baby was going to make him a household name, eventually. He would have the speed and power of an orc, but it would also have brains. It would be all but undefeatable. However, it wasn't eating, and had grown quite pale since returning to Durnhold which was causing Blackmore to get ever so slightly pissed off, taking most of his anger out on Tamis Foxton, causing him no end of agitation as well. Any word? Aye, and all bad. The orc is dying. Won't take anything Blackmore tries to feed it. Only right. He had no business bringing something like that here. It's bad enough we got adult ones screaming all day. I wish they'd hurry up with them internment camps. And it's not Dernold's problem no more. A shrill cry suddenly filled the air, and both Clania and Tamis Foxton turned to see their eldest daughter, Teretha, holding her newborn baby brother, Farolin. Petal, what are you doing up? I hear Dar come home. It's all right. Come here, darling. I so seldom get to see you these days. You're growing like a weed. Tamis then pinched his daughter's cheek gently, and she giggled, and then he returned his attention to his wife, who was now boob-feeding their son. If the orc dies, we'll all suffer for it. Duh. If it's a baby, why are you trying to make it eat meat? Both adults stared at Teretha, stunned. And she simply pointed at her mother. To her, the answer was obvious. And right in front of them. Babies drink milk. 
Damis continued to stare, whilst a slow smile formed across his face. Clania, my dear, she's right. Think what this would mean for our family. If this orc survives because of us, we'll lack for nothing. Clania's face then grew pale. She knew where this was going. You're not asking me... Damis? No. Please. You only have to do it for a little while. They're monsters, Dan. Monsters. And you want me to... Oh, I need to go lie down. When Blackmore heard that his personal servant's wife had agreed to wet nurse the dying baby orc, the Foxton family were indeed showered with gifts. Nice clothes, fancy food, larger living quarters. Tamis Foxton was given a brand new horse, which he named Lady Fire for some reason. Clania, now known as Mistress Foxton, no longer had to report to the kitchens. Even Teresa was rewarded, getting her own tutor called Jaramin Skisson. Unfortunately, the newborn Foxton baby, Farolin, died of fever. Teresa lost a baby brother, but she also gained one. She was fascinated by this strange creature that had joined her family, and devastated when the orc was ripped away from them a full year later. No, hold it thus. Put your fingers here and here. That's better. Now make this motion. Like a snake. What's a snake? The orc was currently trying to master the ability to write. However, he was somewhat struggling with the letter S. <sighs> of course. Snake is a reptile with no feet. It looks like this. Oh, like a worm. All right, fine. A worm. I'll try it again. So the orc did. Sticking his tongue out of the side of his mouth with a look of sheer concentration on his face, he gave this S beast another try. It was a bit wobbly, not the greatest S anyone would ever see, but it would do. Very good, little one. I think it's time we started teaching you numbers. But first, time to teach you how to fight, eh, through. The little orc turned to see his master, Lieutenant Blackmore, enter. So he immediately stood up straight, as Blackmore had taught him. How's he coming along? Very well. I hadn't realised orcs were quite so intelligent. He's not intelligent because he's an orc. He's intelligent because humans taught him. Never forget that, Jaramin. And you. You aren't to forget that either. Thrall shook his head, but remained silent. Look at me, Thrall. Do you know what your name means? Again, Thrall shook his head. It means slave. It means that you belong to me. It means that I own you. Do you understand? At that, Thrall furrowed his brow. Slave? He had a grasp of what that word meant. He'd always assumed his name was a good one. A worthy one. Not something as demeaning as slave. But those thoughts were then interrupted by a sudden sharp slap across his face. You answer when spoken to. I said, do you understand? Yeah, Mr. Blackmore. Excellent. Aidless's face then relaxed into a smile. And in turn, Fruel's lips turned upward as he attempted to mimic the facial expression. Ugh, don't do that, Thrall. Makes you look uglier than you already are. He was just trying to mimic you, sir. That's all. Well, he shouldn't. Humans smile. Orcs don't. Anyway, you said he was doing well. Can you read and write? His reading is in an advanced level. His writing... He understands how, but his thick fingers are giving him a bit of trouble with some of the lettering. That's fine. We no longer have need of your services, then. Fool inhaled swiftly, as did the older tutor. There's still much he doesn't know yet. He knows little of numbers, of history, of art. He doesn't need to master history. I can teach him what he needs to know about numbers. And what does a slave need to know of art? <coughs> that would be a complete waste of time. No, he doesn't need to learn about such poncy things. He needs to learn how to fight. Aedalus then turned back to Thrall. I'm going to see to it that you're skilled with every weapon I've ever seen. I'm going to teach you about strategy, Thrall. And trickery. You're going to be famous in the gladiator ring. People will chant your name. How does that sound, eh? Thrall was sad to see Jaramin collecting his things and moving to depart. But he was also a quick learner. He knew he needed to respond to Aedalus quickly, or else he'd be slapped again. Sounds exciting, Master. A short while later, 
Thrall was taken out of his cell for the first time he could remember, escorted through a bunch of corridors, and then out of a door, outside. However, as soon as they reached the outside, Thrall saw strange black things on the ground. He didn't like those at all, so he froze. What in the blazes are you doing? Come on! Thrall then pointed at the black shapes on the ground, looking ever so slightly terrified, but that feeling of fear was immediately replaced by shame as all the guards started to laugh hysterically. By the light, I've got an orc that's afraid of his own shadow. Aedlus then gestured to one of the guards, who grabbed Thrall and dragged him forward, and they then made their way further outside, until eventually, Thrall found himself face to face with a very strange looking object. That's a training dummy. You use it for practice. Watch. Aedlus then grabbed another strange looking object. This is a wooden sword. Also for practice. You shall be given a proper sword once you've mastered the basics. The lieutenant held the wooden sword with both hands, centred himself, and then struck the training dummy. Now you try. Thrall then took the wooden sword. It certainly fit in his palm a lot easier than the stylus did. Felt better too. Almost familiar. Very good. See boys? He's a natural. Just as I knew he would be. Now Thrall. Attack it. Thrall then lifted the sword and he struck the training dummy with all his might. Thrall was absolutely certain he'd done that wrong, and the punishment was now headed his way, so he was quite surprised to hear a bunch of whoops fill the air, and see a huge smile on his master's face. Did I not say that he would surpass all expectations? Well done, Thrall. Well done. But I broke it. Damn right you did. Suppose you were in the gladiator ring. Suppose that dummy was real. Suppose you charged, and your opponent flew like that. That's a good thing, Thrall. Thrall didn't really understand what the hell was going on, but everyone seemed happy, so whatevs. You, fetch another dummy. Make sure it's secure enough to withstand my Thrall's mighty blows. And bring me five more practice swords whilst you're at it. He's liable to break those as well. Out of the corner of his eye, Thrall saw movement, and turned to see a tall slender man observing from nearby and with him was a very little human being. Looked nothing like any of the other humans the orc had seen before, as far as his memory served him anyway. It looked softer, with long hair and wearing a little dress, and as his eyes locked with the little thing, it smiled and waved at him. What the bloody hell was all that about? For the next several years of Thrall's life, a routine was established. First thing in the morning, he'd be fed, then his hands and feet would immediately be clapped in manacles, and then he'd be led shuffling outside so that he could train. And that was it. That was his life. Blackmore himself had conducted the training at first, showing through all the basics and sometimes throwing the odd bit of praise out. But more often than not, the lieutenant would show his nasty side. No matter what Thrall did, it was never good enough. During these times, Blackmore's speech seemed somewhat more slurred than usual. His movements haphazard. He'd say really strange, obnoxious things, and then just kind of laugh hysterically to himself, as if what he'd just said was absolutely hilarious, and then get all pissy when nobody else laughed with him. Unfortunately, with only this wino as a role model, Thrall came to the conclusion that he was, in fact, simply unworthy. If Blackmore berated him, it must be because he deserved it. But after several months of that, Thrall started to see Blackmore less and less, whilst another bloke, referred to as Sergeant, stepped in and took over his training. This sergeant bloke was pretty huge for a human, well over six feet, very hairy, and weirdly obsessed with an earring in his left ear. See this? I haven't taken this out in 13 years. I've trained thousands of recruits just like you pups, and with each group, I've offered the same challenge. Rip this earring from my ear, and I'll let you beat me to a pulp. Sergeant then grinned, revealing that he had quite a few missing teeth. So you don't know it yet? But by the time I'm done with you, you sell your own mother for the chance to take a swing at me. But if I'm ever so slow that I can't fend off an attack by any of you ladies, then I deserve to have my ear ripped off and be forced to swallow what's left of my teeth. Sergeant then stopped abruptly in front of Thrall. That goes double for you, overgrown goblin. Thrall lowered his gaze, but Sergeant went ahead and grabbed him by the throat and jerked his head right back up again. You look at me when I talk to you. Understand. Sergeant then divided the trainees into pairs. However, the number was uneven, so Thrall found himself standing alone. Let's see how you defend yourself. 
And with that, Sergeant charged, with no warning whatsoever. For the briefest moment, Thrall flinched from the incoming attack, but something inside him then seemed to activate. He started to move not from a place of fear and confusion, but from a place of confidence. However, the sergeant dodged with stunning speed and then struck Thrall several times in quick succession. The orc stumbled for a moment before regaining his footing. He now felt a strange hot emotion surge through him. He didn't know why, but all that mattered to him now was one thing. Kill this son of a bitch. Thrall then roared, startling even himself, before charging, striking fast and repeatedly, raining blows upon the big man. The sergeant tried to retreat, only to slip and fall backwards, at which point Thrall tossed his practice sword aside and reached forward with his hands. This was it. He just needed to fasten his grip around Blackmore's neck. Wait, what? Thrall froze, appalled at himself, appalled at the image that swam before his eyes. A few more moments and he would have killed this man. This man who wasn't Blackmore. And then, several men all piled on Thrall at once, shouting. Hold! Sheath that damn sword, Meriden, or I'll cut your bloody arm off. The sergeant, who did not look like a man who had just been inches away from death, picked himself up, walked right up to Thrall, and then laughed, loudly. Good job, lad. That's the closest I've ever come to having my earring snatched. And in the first match at that, you're a born warrior. But you forgot your goal, didn't you? Aims to take the earring, not squeeze the life out of me. Sorry, Sergeant. I don't know what happened. You attacked and then... Thrall wasn't about to mention the fact that he'd been fantasizing about killing somebody else entirely a few moments prior. Some foes are going to want to do what you just did. Good tactics there. But some opponents, like all the humans you'll face, you're going to want to get them down and then end it. Stop there. The bloodlust might save your hide in a real battle, but for gladiator fighting, you'll need to be more here. Sergeant then tapped his head. Then here. Sergeant then tapped his gut. I want you to read some books on strategy. You read, don't you? A little. You need to learn the history of battle campaigns. These pups all know it. The sergeant gestured towards the other young trainees. For a time, that'll be their advantage. But only for a time, lads. This one's got you all beat in courage and strength. The men all shot Thrall hostile glances, but Thrall didn't give a shit. He now felt a sudden warmth. A happiness he'd not known before. What the hell was this feeling? Sergeant, you said sometimes you don't kill. Why not? It's called mercy, Thrall. You'll learn about that too. Mercy, Thrall thought. What a nice word. A short while later, Tamis Foxton was currently polishing Adolus's boots or something, whilst the lieutenant was currently having a rather heated conversation with the sergeant. Tamis wasn't exactly trying to eavesdrop on said conversation, but Adolus wasn't making it very difficult. You let him do that, do you? It was a good martial move. I treated it the way I would had it been any other man. But Thrall isn't a man. He's an orc. Well, hadn't you noticed? I had, actually. It's not my place to ask why you want him trained so thorough. You're right about that. But you do want him trained thorough, don't you? So that's exactly what I'm doing. By letting him nearly kill you? <laughs> By praising a good move. Teaching him when it's good to use the bloodlust and when it's good to keep a cool head. Look, I understand you taught him to read. I want to have him look at some books. What? At this point, Tamis was no longer polishing the boots at all. He was now standing by the slightly ajar door, staring through the crack, mouth agape. However, a little hand then touched his back, startling him, and he turned to see Teresa, grinning. She knew exactly what her father was up to. Tamis smiled back and raised a finger to his lips, and Teresa nodded. Why would you teach an orc to read if you didn't want him doing so? He's got a brain, whatever else you may think of him. If he wants him trained the way you told me, you got to get him understanding battle tactics, maps, strategies, siege techniques. All right. Ugh, I imagine I'll live to regret this. Adolus then made his way towards a wall of books and quickly selected a few. Teresa! Both Tamis and Teresa jumped, but the small girl smoothed her hair, put on a pleasant expression and entered the room. Here, give these to Thrall's guard to give him. Yes, sir. Teresa replied in a way that suggested this was not the first errand Adolus had sent her on, which Tamis wasn't exactly happy to find out about. They're a bit heavy, sir. 
May I go to my quarters for a sec? Of course, child. But then, take them straight over. Understood? Indeed, sir. Thank you, sir. Teresa then returned to her father. Da, I'm going to get to see him. And Thomas's heart sank. He'd hoped she was over this disturbing interest in the orc. No, Teresa. Just hand the books to the guard is all. It's just since Farrelin died, he's the only little brother I have. He's not your brother. He's an orc. An animal. Remember that. Meanwhile, Thrall was fast asleep in his cell, worn out from all the day's excitement, when suddenly the door slammed open. Lieutenant says these are for you. He wants you to finish them up, be able to talk to him about them. The guard then threw a sack on the ground and buggered off, closing and locking the door behind him, and Thrall went ahead and investigated. Reaching his hand into the sack, he grasped something rectangular and firm. Bloody hell, were these books? Yes! Bloody love books! He pulled one forth and read the title. The History of the Alliance of Law... Law de... Law Lalu, or whatever that word was. Eagerly, he grabbed a second book, and a third. They were all military history books. Interesting. However, as he opened one of the books, a small piece of parchment slipped out. And as he unfolded it, he realised it was a note. I thrill. Master B's ordered that you have these books. I didn't know he'd let you learn to read. He let me learn to read too. I love reading. I miss you. Looks like what they make you do in the courtyard hurts. I hope it doesn't. I'd like to keep talking with you. Do you want to? If yes, write me a note on the back of this one. I'll try to come see you. Keep an eye out for me. I'm the little girl that waved at you. I hope you write back. Love, Teresa. P.S. Don't tell anyone about this note, or else we're in deep shit. Thrall sat down, couldn't believe what he'd just read. Who was this person? Clearly she knew him, and thought well of him as well. Why? Thrall then extended a forefinger, jabbed as deeply as he could into a scratch on his left arm, tore the small wound open, and then used the blood and his finger to write a note of his own. A note which simply said, Yes. Thrall's life continued to be a never-ending cycle of breakfast and training for several more years, but as he got older and his training started to pay off, he was actually allowed to step outside the fortress grounds for more training. Sergeant had suggested it, giving Thrall a bit more freedom would make him a better fighter or something, and Blackmore tentatively agreed to it, but only if he was chained to a boulder the entire time. However, the thought of escaping never once even occurred to Thrall, he was a slave. Blackmore was his master. Sergeant was his trainer. Everything was exactly the way it was supposed to be. Also, during this part of his life, Thrall had frequently overheard the other men with whom he practiced gossip about orcs from time to time. Since they all thought of him as nothing but a mindless brute, they weren't exactly careful with their words around him. They often spoke of how the orcs were growing weaker, more and more being caught, rounded up, and placed in internment camps. Those in charge of said camps all lodged here at Dernhold Keep, with Blackmore being the boss of all of them. However, Thrall had never actually seen an orc, as far as he was aware. But now, at the age of 12 years old, that was about to change. Sergeant called this particular scenario ringing. The other trainees were playing the part of men who had come upon one of the last remaining renegade orcs in the wild, chained to a boulder for some reason. And Thrall, obviously, was to play the part of the orc. Thrall didn't particularly like this scenario. He preferred one-on-one -on -one fighting, not being the target of sometimes up to 12 blokes at once, especially since they all had armor and real weapons, whilst he didn't. Didn't seem fair, really. But it wasn't like he could do anything about it. So, Thrall went ahead and got into character, snarling and acting all savage and stuff, just as Sergeant had told him to do it. And predictably, as was always the case with every group of recruits Thrall had ever practiced with, the first tactic this group chose was a simple straight-on assault. But before Thrall could beat the shit out of every single one of them, a strange noise interrupted the fight. Thrall turned to see a small wagon approaching the fortress. Not exactly an unusual sight, saw that every day. But this wagon was not transporting farmers, or merchants, or new recruits. It was carrying monstrous green beasts. 
The sight of their grotesqueness filled Thrall with horror for a brief moment before the truth hit him. These were orcs. These were his so-called people. This was what he looked like to everyone else. No wonder they hate him so much. I'm a goddamn monster, Thrall thought. One of the beasts within the wagon then seemed to notice Thrall and stared at him for a bit. And then, out of absolutely bloody nowhere, the beast rose up, grabbed the bars of the cell, bent them with his bare hands, hopped off the wagon and started rushing directly towards Thrall. What? What? The beast kept running, yelling things that sounded like they might be words if you had a mouthful of dicks or something. Attack you fools! Sergeant rushed forward, as did the other recruits, but Thrall just kind of stood in place, because he was chained to a boulder. But also because he had no idea what to do. This fearfully ugly thing was charging towards him. It was definitely an enemy, but it was also one of his own people. He didn't want to attack it. Sergeant and the trainees then fell upon the beast, knocking it down, and Thrall just stared at the flash of swords and axes, the chaos of it all, until it was over, and all the men stood back to admire the pile of green and red flesh on the ground that had once been a living creature. Get Thrall back to his cell. Now. What in the name of all that is holy have you done? He was never supposed to see another orc. Oh, now he knows, damn it. What were you thinking? I was thinking, sir, that if you didn't want Thrall to see any other orcs, you might have told me that. Perhaps you might have arranged for the wagons carrying them to arrive when he was in his cell, sir. Well, the damage is done now. We must think how to repair it. So Thrall's never known what he looked like then? Never. No mirrors. No basins of still water. He's been taught that the orcs are scum, which is of course true, and that the only reason he's permitted to live is because he earns me money. Awkward silence then fell for a moment before Sergeant piped up again. So he knows. So what? Just because he was born an orc doesn't mean he can't be more than that. He doesn't have to be a brainless brute. If you encouraged him to think of himself as more human, he's not. He is a brute. I don't want him thinking of himself as some kind of green-skinned human. Then pray, sir, what do you want him to think of himself as? Blackmore had no response to that. He didn't bloody know. He'd never really thought about it. All he knew was that this was extremely frustrating. Everything had seemed so simple all those years ago, when he'd stumbled upon the little ugly orc baby. He could raise it as a slave, train it to fight, put it in charge of an army of captured beaten orcs and then attack the alliance with it and become the most powerful man in the world. Thrall needs direction, and we shall give it to him. He's learned enough training with the recruits. I think it's time we relegated him exclusively to combat. Sir, he's very helpful in training. We have all but vanquished the orcs. Their leader Doomhammer has fled. They're a scattered race. Peace is descending upon us. We do not need to train the recruits to battle orcs any longer. Any battles they face in future will be against other men. Aedilus trailed off a bit, realising that he'd almost just said too much. Men at peace need an outlet for their bloodlust. Let us confide Thrall to gladiator battles. He can fill our pockets and bring us honour. More time passed, with Thrall's daily routine changing somewhat. Instead of training with new recruits, Thrall now took part in gladiator battles. Just as Aedilus just now said. But he was pretty good at gladiator battles, ascending through the ranks at phenomenal speed. He'd already reached his full height and had gained quite a bit of bulk to his tall frame as well. To many, Thrall was the biggest orc they'd ever seen. But when he wasn't in the ring, he was still shut alone in his cell, a cell which felt like it had grown significantly smaller to Thrall. However, it was still his favourite place to be, because when shut alone in his cell, he could converse in secret with his best friend, Teretha. She regularly sent him books with notes hidden inside them, and in those notes she described a world of art, of beauty, of companionship, a world that Thrall desperately wanted to see. The books Tari had sent were also rather interesting to Thrall. Books about orcs, for example, how they lived in small groups, with each one having their own customs and stuff. Which group had he come from, he wondered. Did he still have family out there? However, Thrall wouldn't allow those thoughts to stick around for very long. What was the point? It's not like he could tell Blackmore that he was tired of being a slave, that he wanted to leave. 
Oi, come on. Time to go fight. I hear they've got quite the opponents for you today. Master Blackmore's ready to have your hide if you don't win. Twas a bright day. Warm but not too hot. Perfect fighting weather. An Aedilus Blackmore was mooching about alongside his young protege Lord Caramin Langston. The two of them had already shared a number of drinks, so Langston had actually passed out somewhat. But Aedilus was still going, stuffing his face and pouring red wine down his throat. Life was great. Thrall was generating a whole bunch of money. Everyone had laughed and mocked Aedilus when he'd returned with his little pet orc. But who was laughing now, hmm? Cheers then erupted from the crowd, and Aedilus raised himself up to see that Thrall had won yet another battle in the arena. So he waved his servant Tamis Foxton over. My lord, how many is that today? Ah, uh, how many what, lord? Tamis's eyes seemingly flickered towards the mound of empty bottles on the table before returning to Aedilus, and unfortunately, Aedilus noticed. Counting the bottles, you pathetic excuse for a man. You found out your own wife. Monsters suckling her teats. And you dare imply that I have weaknesses? I wanted to know how many rounds Thrall has won, you cock. Right, of course, sir. Uh, half a dozen. All in a row. Tamith then paused, looking sheepish and miserable. With all due respect, sir, this last one taxed him. You sure you want to put him through more matches? Idiots. Blackmore was surrounded by idiots, he thought. Even Sergeant had given him shit this morning, suggesting the Orc needed more of a rest. What? Do you think I should stop? And give all of these people their money back? No. The odds against him go higher with every battle. He's never, he's never lost. Not once. Just go away, little man. Thrall did indeed win the next battle. Though even Blackmore could see that he was struggling. But the lieutenant still didn't give a shit, and simply waved for the eighth round to begin. For that battle, Thrall faced a pair of mountain cats that had been caught two weeks prior, caged, tormented, and barely fed. The arena gate had barely opened before they pounced as if they'd been fired from a cannon, lunging at Thrall and overwhelming him with stretches, and slashes, and meows. The crowd cried in horror, whilst Blackmore jumped to his feet about to absolutely lose his shit over all the money he was about to lose. However, Thrall then screamed in rage, shook the animals off, grabbed them, and bloody annihilated the bastards. The crowd roared, but Thrall didn't respond in his usual showboaty manner to their applause. He merely stood there, with stooped shoulders, breathing raggedly, before slowly turning his head and looking straight up at Blackmore with a pleading look in his eyes, one which said, Please, no more. And then Thrall collapsed, exhausted. The crowd responded vocally, almost sounded like there was sympathy in the air. Sergeant then entered the arena and addressed the lieutenant in front of the crowd. Lord Blackmore, will you see this last challenge? There was a brief pause, whilst literally everyone stared at Blackmore intently. No. All right then. Sergeant stared for a brief moment, a little bit disgusted, before turning, nodding, and signalling for the final bout to begin. Several men then scurried onto the field, removing the dead mountain cats and handing Thrall the weapon that he was permitted to use for this final round. A morning star, a studded metal ball attached by a chain to a stick. So Thrall climbed to his feet and took the weapon. He was trembling. Everyone could see it, barely able to stand upright. The arena doors started to open, and Thrall prepared himself mentally. But, for a moment, nothing emerged. For just long enough for Thrall to think maybe everything was going to be okay? <laughs> the ogre charged, stabbing with a spear. There was no finesse in its movement, only brute strength. So Thrall didn't have to try too hard to dodge and strike. However, Thrall's exhaustion prevented him from getting any real power behind his blow. So the ogre simply shrugged it off, slapped the morning star out of Thrall's hand, and impaled the poor sod. The crowd gasped, and Blackmore stared in horror whilst Thrall collapsed to the ground and was now being beaten and pummeled. He'd lost. It was over. How could he have done this to me? Aedilus thought. Thrall! 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 A bunch of guards hastened onto the field, tossing a magical net over the ogre, while stretching Thrall off gently, the sight of which caused the chanting crowd to cheer in approval. 
but Aedalus certainly wasn't happy. If his slave wasn't such a fan favourite, he would have punished him there and then. But Thrall would indeed be punished. Too much money had been lost this day. Thrall woke up in his cell, not entirely sure how he'd got there. But after that initial shock, he then realised he'd never felt this much pain in his entire life. Every fibre of his being wanted to just fall unconscious. Where were the healers? Blackmore always sent healers when Thrall was injured. And the Master would always visit, provide praise. Sure, Thrall had lost. That was a first. But surely the Master would still appreciate how well Thrall fought for nine battles in a row. Soon enough, Thrall heard the cell door open. He couldn't lift his head to see, but the sound of his master's voice came soon after. The healers will be here, but they won't be here any time soon. I want to see you suffer, you poxy son of a whore. A boot then kicked Thrall straight in the stomach. Lost thousands because of you. Thousands. More strikes landed from both boot and fist, over and over and over again. And Thrall just lay there in absolute agony. Blackmore had seen him. He knew how exhausted he'd been, but had seen him rally again and again and again, holding his own eight out of the nine times. He'd fought with everything he had, and yet still it was not good enough for Blackmore. Nothing was good enough for Blackmore. Let the others have their turn. Rip. The master stepped away, but Thrall could now hear other footsteps. Several men, by the sounds of it. And then, all of them started beating the crap out of him. And it was in that moment that Thrall finally passed out. Sometime later, the orc woke up again, this time with three healers working on him, using their salves and stuff. He could feel that breathing was already much easier, and that the pain had somewhat subsided. Thank you. Don't flatter yourself, monster. Once the coin stops flowing, so too does the salves. So you'd better not lose again. And so, Thrall stayed silent the entire rest of the time the healers were there. They may have had gentle touches, but there was no compassion in these men. Thrall understood now. They only healed him because Blackmore paid them to do so. Eventually those three assholes left, and Thrall sat upright, only to be startled by the fact that Sergeant was standing right there. I pulled him off you, but not before they'd had their sport. I'm sorry, lad. You amazed me in the ring today. He ought to be prouder than hell of you, but instead... Look, I just... I want you to know that you didn't deserve what he did. Get some sleep, eh? Sergeant nodded and left. Thrall appreciated the man's words. He truly did. But it was too little too late. He was done with all of this. There was absolutely nothing he could do to earn the love and respect he so desperately craved. Not here, anyway. He was sick and tired of being used. Now is not the time for sleeping. Now is the time for planning. So, Thrall went ahead and grabbed a bit of paper and a stylus and wrote a note to the only person in this world he could truly trust. Terry, on the next dark moons, I plan to escape. Thrall was careful not to give anyone any hint of his newfound plan. He kept his eyes low, behaved as obediently as he possibly could, and for the first time in his life absolutely hated himself for that. He drew as little attention to himself as possible. Let them all think they'd broken him. That was the intention. But deep down, also for the first time in his life, Thrall had something to look forward to. What would it be like to walk in the sunlight without dragging a boulder behind him? To sleep under the stars? What would it be like to meet one of his own people? He'd read about them in the books Tarry had given him, sure. Managed to learn a little bit of the Orcish language after that unfortunate run-in a few chapters ago. But the books were all biased, written by humans. And Thrall had spent enough time with humans to realise by this point that they were all full of shit. He was grateful to Sergeant and Tarry for teaching him concepts like honour and kindness. But if they hadn't taught him that, he never would have realised that a lot of humans don't exactly behave with those qualities. Especially Blackmore. That man wasn't honourable or kind at all. But all of that aside, Tonight was the night. Tarry had responded to his note, and together they'd hatched a plan. A plan that was so crazy, it just might work. Fire! Fire! Thrall lay very still, with his eyes closed, feigning sleep. Well, he's not going anywhere. Damn monsters could sleep through anything. Come on, let's go give him a hand. Two guards outside his cell ran off, and as soon as he was sure he was alone, Thrall rose, took a deep breath, and then charged directly at the cell door. 
The door gave way, but not entirely, so he struck it again, and again, slamming into it five times before the door surrendered with a crash. Thrall himself fell with it, landing heavily on the floor, but the surge of excitement and adrenaline he felt was enough to numb the pain. Thrall then made his way through the hallways, knowing exactly where he was going. He had been escorted through this keep every single day of his entire life. Eventually, he reached the courtyard and peered out to see absolute chaos. The barns had been almost completely engulfed in flames. He made his way across the courtyard, heart pounding. Probably only took a few moments, but to Thrall it felt like an eternity. He then slipped out through the main gates, and at that point, he threw caution to the wind and bloody cheesed it. A short while later, Thrall reached a rock formation in the forest, one that Tarry had told him about. There was a cave near here, she'd said. And sure enough, there was. Before Thrall entered it, he found himself wondering if this was some kind of trap, one that Teresa herself had set, but he dismissed those thoughts quickly, feeling ashamed that would even occur to him. Teresa had been nothing but kind. She wouldn't betray him. Thrall then entered the cave and saw Teresa sat there waiting for him. Did you have any trouble? None. Plan worked well. There was so much chaos I think an entire village of orcs could have escaped. I saw you release the animals before setting fire to the barn. Of course. They're just innocent creatures. I never want to see them harmed. Now, we best hurry. Here. Teresa reached into her bag and pulled out a scroll of some kind. A map? Yeah. Most accurate one I could find. Here's Dernhold. We're slightly southwest. Here. The internment camps are all within a 20 mile radius. Here. Here. Your best chance for safety is to head over here. To the wilderness. I've heard there's still some of your people hiding out there. Blackmore's men have never been able to find them. Thrall felt an overwhelming sense of gratitude fill him. Almost brought tears to his eyes. Why are you doing this? Why are you helping me? Because I remember you when you were a baby. You were like a little brother to me. When, when my brother died, you were all I had. I saw how they treated you, and I hated it. I wanted to help you, be your friend. I have no more fondness for our master than you do. Has he hurt you? It's more complicated than that. Tell me. Thrall, time is... Tell me. You've been my friend, Teresa, for ten years. You were a light in the darkness. So please, tell me. Tears then started to pour down Tarry's face cheeks. Um, I'm Blackmore's mistress, Thrall. What does that mean? You're so innocent. So pure. Someday you'll understand. Thrall didn't fully comprehend what Teresa was saying, but he still felt angry about it. Come with me. I can't. What'd he do to my family if I left? No. I can't leave, Thrall. But you can. So please, go. Be free. For both of us. Thrall nodded, unable to speak. He knew he was going to miss this girl, but now, in this moment, the pain of their parting seemed to cut deeper than the spear from that ogre. I've packed you some food and water. And there's a knife in there too. I didn't dare take anything else that might be missed. But I do want you to have this. Terry then bowed her head and removed a silver chain from her neck, with a crescent moon dangling from it. Not far from here, there's an old tree that was split by lightning. The master gives me leave to wander there when I wish. If you ever need anything, place this necklace in the trunk of that tree, and I'll know to meet you in this cave again. Terry. Hurry, I need to get back soon before I'm missed. Teresa then wrapped her arms around Thrall, and Thrall tensed, not really sure what was happening. The only other time people had been this close to him, it had been an attack, but some feeling inside him told him that this was a sign of affection. So he patted her on the head. I call you a monster. They're the monsters, not you. Farewell, Thrall. Terry then turned and buggered off, running back towards the keep, whilst Thrall sighed deeply, picked up the sack of runaway stuffs, left the cave, and began to stride towards his destiny. Thrall was fully aware that Teresa had pointed out where the internment camps were specifically so that he could not go there, and that she'd mentioned that there were some free orcs living out in the wilderness somewhere, but he had no bloody idea where they were, or if they were even still alive. However, he knew for certain that there would be orcs at said internment camps, so that's where he was going. He didn't choose the nearest one, that would be dumb, he picked one that was several leagues away from the fortress he'd spent his entire life in. 
and as he jogged his way towards his chosen destination, his mind raced. Would these orcs even be able to understand his speech? Or was it so tainted by a human accent that even basic conversation would be impossible? What if they challenged him? He didn't want to fight them. Would he even be able to fight them? According to the books he'd read, orcs were fierce, proud, unstoppable warriors. But it wasn't all anxiety and worry in Thrall's mind. He was also excited. Maybe he could find his clan, his family. Thrall ran all night, only stopping to rest once the sun had already begun to rise. He'd needed to put as much distance between himself and Dernhold as possible. Meanwhile, Blackmore had never been angrier in his entire life. He'd been roused from his slumber, alone, because the Foxton girl had claimed she was ill or something. The clamour of bells had drawn him to his window only to see billowing orange flames across the courtyard. He'd raced to join the rest of Dernhold's populace to try and contain the blaze, but it had taken several hours to get the fire under control. It's a miracle no one was hurt. Not even the animals. There's no way they could have escaped on their own. Can't be certain, my lord, but we may be looking at arson. You really think so? Who'd want to do something like that? I'd count all my enemies on my hands, except I'd run out of fingers. Plenty of bastards out there jealous of my rank. And my... Oh, Lothar's ghost. Thomas and Langston stared inquisitively at the Lieutenant General, but he didn't have time to voice his concerns. Instead, he just suddenly bolted. What is it? Blackmore raced back into the keep, through a bunch of corridors until finally reaching a door that had been smashed to pieces. Shit. His worst fear had come true. Thomas, I want men. Horses. Flying machines. I want Thrall back immediately. Meanwhile again, Thrall was currently in the deepest sleep he'd ever had. The soft grass beneath his body, the breeze caressing his face. So this was freedom. It was glorious. However, that deep slumber was then interrupted by a spear prodding him in his neck. Get up. Thrall opened his eyes to see a bunch of human faces peering down at him and cursed under his breath. Two of the men maintained their proddy spear positions, whilst the rest began to rummage through his bag of runaway stuffs. Plenty of food here. Good stuff too. We'll eat well tonight, lads. It's Major Remke who'll be eating well. Not if she don't know about it, and we ain't going to tell her. And looky here, a knife. Stole all this, did you? Guys, come on. You know we have to report all this. And what if I don't? What are you going to do about it? It's what I'm going to do about it that ought to concern you, Holt. Another man then approached. The rules exist so that we can keep an eye on the orcs. This is the first one we've seen in years carrying a human weapon. It's worth reporting. And as for these... Thor then felt a pit in his stomach. For this man was now leafing through all of the letters that Teretha had ever sent. I don't suppose you can read, can you? All the others burst out laughing, but it seemed this man was being deadly serious. He approached Thrall, thrusting the letters into the orc's face. You. Read. The man then proceeded to point at Thrall, and then at the letters, and then at Thrall, and then at the letters. So Thrall played the part of just another savage and shook his head violently. He looks familiar to me. They all look the same. Well, it's too bad none of us can read. These papers probably would have told us a lot. At that, Thrall sighed in relief, quietly to himself. Eh, <laughs> you're always dreaming above your station, Warwick. The man, apparently called Warwick, then shoved the letters back into the bag. Come on, pack the food back up. Let's take him back to camp. A short while later, the group of men had indeed dragged Thrall back to their camp, and upon arrival, the first thing that struck Thrall was the smell. It smelled like shit. <laughs> Look at him, wrinkling his nose. Been away from his own kind too long, looks like. Forgotten how bad they smell. Thrall then felt his bonds loosen, so he picked himself up, and immediately stared in horror. The hell was this? Thrall thought. Were these men drugging orcs or something? That had to be the answer. Orcs were fierce. They weren't whatever this was. Go on. Food's put out once a day. There's water in the troughs. Warwick then pointed and waved his hand, as if to dismiss Thrall, so he did as he was told, boldly striding towards a small group of orcs sitting nearby. He could feel Warwick's eyes boring into the back of his head, though, as he walked away. I swear I've seen him before. Thrall then reached the small group, 
his heart racing. He then sat down, took a deep breath, and started to use the small amount of orcish language that he actually knew. I greet you. The orc stared at him, but said nothing, so he tried again. I, uh, I greet you. There was more awkward silence, but one of the other orcs then finally spoke up, and to Thrall's surprise, they spoke in the human language. Where'd they catch you? You weren't raised to speak orcish, that much is clear. You're right. I was raised by humans. They taught me only a little orcish. I was hoping you could teach me more. The orcs looked at each other for a moment, before bursting into laughter. Raised by humans. Hey, Krakus, come over here. We got ourselves a good storyteller. All right, Charmin, tell us another one. Thrall could feel his chance to connect with these people slipping away. Please, I mean no insult. I'm a prisoner, like you. I've never met any orcs. I just want... However, one of the orcs then raised his head, revealing bright red fiery eyes, causing Thrall to fall silent. So you want to meet your people? Well, you've met us. Now leave us be. Your eyes. The red-eyed orc cringed, covered his face and hunched away. And before Thrall could ask any of the other orcs what that was all about, they all buggered off as well, leaving him standing alone, thinking about how he'd just severed every tie he'd ever known in order to live his life as a prisoner, in a camp full of people that hated his guts. Great choice, Thrall. Great choice. However... We were not always as you see us here. Thrall was surprised to see the red-eyed orc had returned. Soulless. Afraid. Ashamed. This is what they did to us. If we could be rid of it, our hearts and spirits might return. Go on. I'm listening. It had been two days since the fire and Thrall's escape, and Blackmore had spent most of that time angry. Soaking about. Which was pretty crap for everyone at Durnhold, so Tamis Foxton suggested the master go out and do a bit of hunting to blow off some steam. So, both Adolus Blackmore and Teresa Foxton were now galloping about, and as Adolus watched his mistress, Canter, on the pretty dapple grey that he'd given her, his mind started to think about other things that he'd quite like to be doing with her at this moment. What an unexpectedly ripe fruit this Foxton daughter had blossomed into. She'd been a lovely obedient child, and now she'd matured into a lovely obedient woman. He bloody loved burying his face in her boobies. His second, Langston, had once asked him when he was going to toss this mistress aside in favour of a proper wife, to which Adelus had responded, I won't toss her aside, even when I do take a wife. There's plenty of time for such things, when my plan finally comes to fruition. Adelus would be in a much better position to pick and choose the best wife, after he'd brought the alliance to its collective knees. However, despite being an utter dick, Aedlus was growing rather fond of Teresa in his own way. It wasn't just lust anymore. He'd started to enjoy her presence. Even watched her sleep on a few occasions, like some kind of creep. In fact, Aedlus had started to wonder if he was actually falling in love with Teresa. Teresa then looked over from her horse, and for a moment, her and Aedlus' eyes met. Come over here and suck my... My lord, we might have news of Thrall. A short while later, Major Lauren Remke was hanging about in her quarters, waiting whilst one of her female orc servants was drawing her a bath. Make sure it's hot, Grey Kick. And don't forget the herbs this time. Yes, my lady. However, there was then a knock at the door, and Remka sighed. Whatever it is, better be good. What, Warwick? We captured an orc yesterday. Right. Great. Well done. That's literally your job. I thought he looked familiar. By the light, Warwick. They all look the same. No, this one looked different, and I know why now. Warwick then stepped aside, revealing another man standing behind him, and Major Emker immediately snapped to attention. Lieutenant General, how may we be of service? Major Emker, I believe you've found my lost pet. Meanwhile, through all sat, absolutely captivated, as the red-eyed orc continued to tell tales of valour and strength. Battles against impossible odds. Heroic deeds. All of the things. But before we were the proud, battle-hungry horde, we were individual clans. There were those who knew the magic of wind and water, of sky and land, the spirits of the wild. We called them shaman. Until the emergence of the warlocks, their skills were the only power we knew. The orc, named Kalgar, then spat angrily. Power. Does it feed our people? Raise our young. Our leaders held it all for themselves. 
Only the barrett's trickle dripped down to the rest of us. They did something, Thrall. I don't know what, but as soon as we were defeated, all desire to fight bled out of us, as if from an open wound. Thrall again looked around the camp. <sighs> the desire to fight still seems strong in you, though, Thrall, even if your name suggests otherwise. Perhaps you being raised by humans spared you this. There are others like you, still out there. Where can I find them? There's one I've heard tell of. Grom Hellscream. His people. The Warsong clan. They were somewhere out west. But that's all I know. Come with me, Kelgar. <sighs> Thrall. I could kill any of the guards here in a heartbeat. Anyone here could. But there's just... No desire. I don't want to run. I just want to stay here. I can't explain it. But that's the truth. Thrall didn't really understand, but nodded in acceptance anyway. No matter how little it made sense, it was clear. <sighs> now, Kalgar had mentioned there was only a skeleton roster of guards at night that would often drink themselves into a stupor, so Thrall continued to pretend to be just another docile orc for the next few hours, waiting for his opportunity. However, at some point, a female orc approached Thrall, moving with a sense of purpose rarely seen here. You are the newly captured orc? My name is Thrall. Then, Thrall, you must know that the commander of the encampments is coming for you. What's his name? Thrall knew the answer already. I don't know, but he wears green and slurs his words like he's got brain damage. Blackmore. There was a loud clanging, and all the orcs around the camp started to pick themselves up and turn towards a large tower. We had a line up. Thrall, you have to go now. The guards will be distracted at the thought of the commander coming. The end of the camp is the least guarded. I'll create a diversion. Go. Thrall didn't need any further urging, turning on his heel and running as fast as he could. But as he ran, he heard a cry of pain coming from behind him. He didn't dare stop and look back, but when he heard Kelgar shouting harsh-sounding words in Orkish, he kind of put two and two together. The distraction that Kelgar had mentioned was apparently to reach deep down inside, find the shadow of his old fighting spirit, and then punch the female orc right in the face. Thrall ran for the next several hours. He didn't stop until he was physically incapable of running any longer. And then, started to think about what the plan was now. The West. Thrall needed to find this hell screen, And together, they could liberate their imprisoned brothers and sisters. Meanwhile again, back at the camp that Thrall had just run away from, Blackmore paced down the line of assembled orcs, wincing at the stench. Where is the one you thought was Thrall? I saw him at the gladiator battles. His blue eyes were... Where is he? I, I, I don't see him, sir. Warwick could see that the Lieutenant General did not look pleased. He needed to think of something fast, in order to ensure he didn't spend the rest of his life cleaning toilets. We did find some goods that he'd stolen. Do you recognise this? Warwick then extended a dagger to Blackmore. This is mine. Anything else? Some papers. Major Remka hasn't had the time to look at them. And, um... And you're an idiot who can't read. Give them here. Blackmore snatched the pieces of parchment and started to leaf through them. Wish I could talk to you instead of just sending letters. I'll see you in the ring and my heart breaks for you. What the bloody hell was this? Aedlus thought, before reading through another one. Harder and harder to find time to write. Our master demands so much of both of us. I heard that he beat you. I'm so sorry, my dear friend. And then, Aedlus's eyes and heart filled with anger. The anger of betrayal. Teretha. My lord, is all well? No, Major Remka. All is not well. You had my orc, one of the finest gladiators ever to grace the ring. He's made me a great deal of money over the years, and was supposed to make me a great deal more. It is beyond doubt that it is he your man captured, and yet I do not see him in this line at all. He could be hiding inside the camp. He could be. Let us hope so, for your continued good fortune, Major Remke. Search the encampment. Now. The Major scurried off quickly. However, the search of the encampment, obviously, turned up nothing. So, Blackmore immediately demoted Remke, put Warwick in her place, and then rode slowly home, stewing in anger and bitterness the entire way. Once back, he headed to his bedchambers, and then approached the bed itself, quietly, so as not to wake the sleeping Teresa Foxton. 
He then leant down close to her face. Sleep well, pretty traitor. Sleep well until I have need of you. Thrall had never been so bloody hungry in his entire life. He still much preferred freedom to captivity, but he was now very aware that he had almost no survival skills whatsoever. He couldn't even catch squirrels. However, after several days of pushing through forest and undergrowth, Thrall suddenly found the sweet scent of roasting meats fill his nostrils. It was a good thing he didn't allow his hunger to completely overcome his caution though, because as he moved to the edge of the forested area, he then saw dozens of humans joyfully preparing a feast. Thrall started salivating. They had breads, jams, cheese, but alongside all the glorious foodstuffs was a scene of happiness and contentment, and Thrall wanted nothing more than to belong here. Alas, he did not. He was an orc, a monster, a green-skinned son of a bitch. So he just sat and watched as the humans feasted and danced the night away. Eventually, the moons rose, furniture and plates and cutlery were gathered up, and the humans all buggered off into their dwellings. And finally, Thrall got up and moved with skillful silence towards the village. His sense of smell had always been acute, but it was hyper-focused now due to him being absolutely starving. He made his way from window to window, reaching in and snatching any food he could find, making sure not to take too much from any one household though. However, through one window, Thrall witnessed children sleeping on straw mattresses. Two boys and one blonde little girl, the sight of which caused a sharp punch in Thrall's fields. He was immediately transported back to the day he'd first seen Teretha, as she'd smiled broadly and waved at him. This girl looked so much like her. Suddenly, a harsh noise then startled Thrall, and he turned just in time to see a four-legged beast charging at him. Was this a wolf? It had pointy ears, sharp teeth, looked a bit like pictures of wolves he'd seen. Human voices then filled the air, crying in alarm. The little girl was now awake and staring at him through the window. Monster! The hateful word wounded Thrall, but he knew he couldn't just stand around crying about it. However, turning on his heel, he then realised he was surrounded by frightened villagers. I mean you no harm. It talks! It's a demon! These weren't his enemies, he thought. They may fear and hate him, but they were simple farmers, living their simple lives with their simple families. And so, Thrall took advantage of the shock in the crowd and cheesed it. The men did not pursue, just as Thrall had expected. They just wanted to be left in peace. But still, Thrall ran, for quite a while. He again ran until he was physically incapable of running any further, and then collapsed and passed out. A short while later, something prodded Thrall in the belly, stirring him awake, and as he opened his eyes, he saw several angry orc faces. He then tried to get up, but the orcs wouldn't let him, and then one of them got all up in his face grill. <coughs> Thrall had no idea what was just said, so he just shook his head. And the orc, even more angrily, then grabbed Thrall's ears. <coughs> I'm not deaf. Human, you not speak orcish. I speak a little. My name is Thrall. The orc stared for a moment, but then burst out laughing. Human that looks like orc. Kill him. No. Despite the danger and urgency of the situation, there was one thing that filled Thrall with hope. These orcs were fierce. They weren't sitting around in their own shit. One fine Grom Hellscreen. At that, the big angry orc froze. Why fine? You said kill? From human? No. Cam's bad. Orcs. Me want orcs. Grom help. Thrall then waited, hoping his broken orcish should manage to convey what he wanted. A slightly smaller orc then piped up, which the leader responded to heatedly, and they argued for a bit. And then, the big angry one turned back to Thrall. Try to say maybe. Maybe you see Hellscream. If you're worthy. Come. The orcs then hauled Thrall to his feet, and started to march him forward, prodding him with a spear, urging him to pick up the pace. But, despite all of that, Thrall still couldn't help but smile. He remained silent the entire journey listening to the conversation between the orcs escorting him. His orcish wasn't brilliant, but he understood enough. They spoke of the listlessness that seemed to have fallen upon some of their kin, and like Thrall, they weren't big fans of it. They spoke of their warlord, Hellscream, with words of praise and awe. And they spoke of Thrall, wondering if he was some kind of spy, leading a cowardly ambush. When that was suggested, the group came to a halt, with the big angry orc approaching Thrall and thrusting a blindfold at him. So Thrall obediently put it on. He trusted these orcs. 
Not like he had any other choice, anyway. Eventually, after several more paragraphs, Thor's blindfold was removed, and he could now see that he was in a large underground cave. However, none of the orcs standing around looked even remotely chieftain-like. Said you'd take me to Hellscream. I don't see him. You do not see him, but he is present. He sees you. This new orc, almost as tall as Thrall but without the bulk, approached. He looked old and tired, but carried himself in a manner that demanded respect, which Thrall decided to give. This may be, but I wish to speak with him, not merely bask in his unseen presence. You have spirit, fire, that is well. I am Isgar, advisor to the great chieftain Hellscream. My name is... You are known to us, Thrall of Dernholt. Many have heard of Lieutenant General Blackmore's pet hawk. A growl escaped Thrall's throat. He wasn't going to lose his composure, but he wasn't a big fan of hearing that term come from the mouth of one of his own people. We haven't seen you fight, of course. Orcs aren't allowed to watch gladiator battles. But while you were finding glory in the ring, your brethren were beaten and abused. I received none of the glory. I was a slave, owned by Blackmore. And if you do not believe that I despise him, then see this. Thrall twisted round to show everyone his back, and there was an awkward silence for a moment, until the entire cave erupted in laughter. There is nothing to see, Thrall of Dernhold. Thrall then realised why everyone was laughing. The clerics and their healing salves had done a little bit too good a job. Not a single scar remained on his back. <sighs> Look, I was a thing. A piece of property. Kept in a cell and brought out for their amusement. The scars on my body are not visible. I realize that now. There are scars you cannot see that run much deeper. I escaped, was thrown into the camps, and then I came here to find Hellscream. Now I'm beginning to doubt he even exists. Perhaps it was too much to hope for, to find an orc that still exemplifies who I understood our people to be. A couple of murmurs from the bystanding orcs. What do you understand our people to be, then? Orc who bears the name of slave. Strong. Cunning. Powerful. With spirits that cannot be quenched. Let me see Hellscream, and he will know that I am worthy. We will be the judge of that. This guy then raised his hand. Three orcs stepped forward. These are our three finest warriors. They are, as you said, strong, cunning, powerful. They fight to kill or die, unlike your gladiator battles. Your play acting will not serve you here. Only real skill will save you. If you survive, Hellscream may grant you an audience. Or he may not. He will see me. You'd best hope so. Begin. Initially, Thrall was caught off guard, but that didn't last very long, because a lifetime of training then kicked in. One of the three orc warriors charged at him, so he swiftly dodged, disarmed the bugger, and landed a strike of his own in one fluid motion. So that was easy. One down, two to go. Thrall then turned to face the remaining opponents, and snarled. He could feel the bloodlust rising. Felt pretty good. However, the second orc then charged, whilst the third one attempted to come in from behind, these were clever opponents, acting with coordination rather than just taking it in turns to attack him. But Sergeant's training had prepared him for this. All those ringing scenarios. This was nothing. Hell, his arms almost moved on their own, knocking both orcs down with ease. One of the orcs stayed down, somehow having broken both of his legs in the fall. But the other one roared in frustration, and immediately attempted to impale Thrall. However, again, Thrall handled it with ease, catching the guy off balance. He then straddled the poor bloke and wrapped his hands around their throat. All he had to do was squeeze. Squeeze tight. Kill Blackmore for what he did. No, Thrall thought. This isn't Blackmore. Why did he keep thinking everyone was bloody Blackmore? We kill. Kill your opponent, Thrall. It's what a real orc would do. Thrall looked towards Iskar and shook his head. In battle, yes. I would kill my foe in battle. So he does not rise up against me in another time. But you are my people, whether you will own me as one or not. We're too few in number for me to kill him. This guy raised an eyebrow and paused for a moment. Your reasoning is understandable. You have honorably defeated our three finest warriors. You've passed the first test. The first test, Thrall thought. 
How many bloody tests are there? What's the next challenge? Question of will. With a slight smirk on his face, Isgar then raised his hand once again, and an orc emerged from one of the tunnels, carrying a heavy sack. The orc then tossed the sack to the ground, and Thrall very quickly realised what was in it. A child. Human. Bound hand and foot with a gag in its mouth. Nails mature to become orc killers. They are our natural enemies. If you truly are scarred by whip and rod, and wish for revenge, exact it now. Kill this child, before he grows to an age to kill you. Thrall stared. Was he being serious? This is no warrior. There's no honour in this. For you lies a future threat. Defend your people. He's a child. He's no threat now. And who can say if he will be? I know the clothes he wears. What village he was taken from. These people are farmers. If we again go to war, then this boy will be on the front line. Do you wish to see Hellscream or not? If you do not slay this child, you may rest assured that you may not leave this cave alive. The boy was understandably now crying his eyes out. The sight of which managed to remind Thrall of Teretha for some reason. Thoughts of her flooded his mind. Thoughts of Sergeant. Thoughts about how sad he'd felt when his appearance had frightened that little girl back at the village. But then thoughts of Blackmore reared their ugly head. Thoughts of all the men who had spat upon him, called him monster. But those dark thoughts did not condone cold-blooded murder. If the child takes up arms against me in the future, then I'll kill him on the battlefield. Hell, I'll take pleasure in doing so because I'll know that I'm fighting for my people. But I will not kill a bound child. If this means I never see Hellscream, then so be it. If it means I must fight all of you and fall beneath your numbers, then so be it. I'd rather die than commit such a dishonorable atrocity. A pity. But you have chosen your own destiny. Iskar then went to raise his hand for a third time, but a sudden horrific hellish scream then filled the air. Some kind of Hellscream or something. It reverberated and echoed around the entire cavern, and then a very chieftain-like looking orc entered. Never have I thought to see this. How is it you know of mercy, Thrall of Durnhold? Noble Hellscream, we'd thought that this child's capture would please you. We expected... I would expect that its parents would track it down to our lair, you fool. We're warriors, fierce and proud. We do not butcher children. Take him back where you found him. The Warsong chief then marched over to the child, and the child understandably shit itself. Listen to me, tiny man. Tell your people that the orcs had you, and chose not to harm you. Tell them that we showed you mercy. The boy nodded, despite being an absolute terrified mess. Take him back now, and the next time you find a human pup, leave it be. Some orcs scurried over, and with a definite lack of gentleness, grabbed the boy by the arm and dragged him off. My lord... This is the pet of Blackmore. He stinks of humans. He even brags of his fear of killing. I do not fear killing those who deserve to die. Iskar, my old friend. You've seen me when the bloodlust has come. You've seen me wade in blood up to my knees. I've killed the children of humans before. We gave all we had fighting in that manner. And where has it brought us? Low. And defeated. Slouching in camps. Long have I thought the ancestors would show me a new way. A way to win back what we've lost. Thrall was strong enough to defeat the finest we had to offer. He's escaped from the camps. And against the odds, managed to find me. I agree with his choices here today. And one day, my old friend, you too will see the wisdom in this. Now leave us. All of you. So, slowly and reluctantly, the crowd of orcs and Iskar buggered off. Throwing a few salty glances, Thrall's way on their way out. Are you hungry, Thrall of Durnholt? Ravenous. But I would ask that you don't call me that. I escaped Durnholt. I loathe the thought of it. Hellscream lumbered off through a tunnel for a bit, before returning with a whole bunch of meat. Should we change your other name? It is a term for slave. No doubt meant to be a badge of shame. No. Blackmore gave me that name so that I'd never forget that I was something he owned. And I won't. I'll never forget. I'll keep the name. And one day when I see him again, he'll be the one that remembers what he did to me. And he'll regret it with all his heart. You would kill him then. Thrall did not answer immediately, but there was no hesitation in his mind. Why did he keep thinking everyone was Blackmore in fights? Because he wanted them to be Blackmore. Yes. 
If any creature deserves death, it's Aedilus Blackmore. Good. At least you're willing to kill someone. Hellscream then gestured towards a piece of tattered cloth tucked in Thrall's waistband. That doesn't look human-made. So Thrall tugged the swaddling cloth free and handed it over. It isn't. This is the cloth in which Blackmore found me when I was an infant. And I forgot all about it, to be honest. I know this pattern. Where did Blackmore find you? You only ever told me it was not far from Durnhall. And your family was a long way from home. I wonder why. Did you know them? Do you know who my parents were? I can only say that this is the emblem of the Frostwolf clan. They lived a great distance from here, up in the mountains. Exiled by Gul'dan, and I never learned why. Druidan and his people always seemed loyal to me. Thrall then fell silent, feeling ever so slightly disappointed. Another question, if you can answer it. When I was younger, I was training outside. A wagon passed, carrying several captured orcs. One of them broke free. Attacked me. He kept screaming something over and over. I was never able to learn what he said, but I remember the words. Speak them, and I shall tell you. Well, that was no attack, my young friend. He was yelling, run. I will protect you. Thrall again, fell silent. Jesus. We were doing a training exercise. A fighting drill. He thought they were making sport of me. And I was being attacked 12 to 1. He died trying to protect me. For the next several days, Thrall had a whale of a time. Joining the Warsong Orcs in feasts and revelry all the while learning a whole bunch more stuff about his people. Hellscream spoke of a time when each clan was separate unto itself, with each having their own symbols and customs, and even speech. And the Warsong Chieftain also spoke further on their spiritual leaders, called shamans, who worked with the magic of nature, not evil magic of demonic supernatural powers. Isn't magic magic? Yes and no. Sometimes the effect is the same. If a shaman was to summon lightning to strike an enemy, they'd be burned to death. If a warlock was to summon hell's flames against an enemy, they would also be burned to death. So magic is magic. But lightning is a natural phenomenon. You call it by requesting it. With hell's fire, you make a bargain. It costs a little of yourself. But you said the shamans were disappearing. Doesn't that mean the warlock's way was better? It was quicker, more effective, or so it seemed. But there comes a time when a price must be paid, and sometimes it is dear indeed. The conversation then turned to the peculiar lethargy demonstrated by the vast majority of orcs. No one can explain it, but it claimed nearly all of us one by one. I thought it some kind of illness at first, but it doesn't kill. One of the orcs at the camp thought it might have something to do with... Thrall then fell silent. He certainly didn't want to say something potentially insulting. Just say it, Thrall. To do with what? With the redness of the eyes. Ah, perhaps it does at that. There is something we wrestle with that you, blue-eyed youngling, cannot possibly understand. I hope you never do. In that moment, Hellscream almost appeared small and frail, and Thrall realised he was actually quite thin for an orc. Although Thrall didn't say any of this out loud, Hellscream certainly picked up on it, simply nodding and then changing the subject. You said that one was able to rally enough to help you escape. That gives me hope. If these people could take their destinies into their own hands, I believe they would rouse themselves. But none of us have ever been in one of these accursed camps. So please, tell me all you know, Thrall. So, Thrall went ahead and did just that. He described the camp, the orcs, the guards and security measures, all in as much detail as he could, and Hellscream listened intently. Hmm. The humans are lulled into a sense of safety by our shameful lack of honour. That could work to our advantage. It's long been a dream of mine, Thrall, to storm these wretched places and liberate those captured there. Though I fear that once the gate is down, none of them will fly to freedom. Regrettably, that seems true. And it's up to us to awaken them. I think it no accident, Thrall, that you've come at this time. Gul'dan is no more. His warlocks are scattered. It's time for what we once were to re-emerge. Meanwhile... Go away. My lord, there's news. Lord Langston's here to see. Ugh, send him in, you father of a whore. Karamin then entered the room. Yeah, 
Wonderful news, my lord. We've had a sighting. Several leagues from the internment camp, headed due west. Some villagers were awakened when an orc tried to break into their homes. Seems it was hungry. When they surrounded it, it spoke. A few days later, one of the farmer's sons was kidnapped by a group of orcs. They took him to a cave and ordered some large orc to kill him. That orc refused, and the boy was released. Yeah, and here's the kicker. The confrontation took place with the orc speaking in the human tongue, because the large orc couldn't speak any orcish. Blackmore nodded and smiled. Yeah. So, he immediately rode out to follow up on this new lead, and Teresa watched him from a window. And as she watched, she had two passionate conflicting thoughts. One, she really hoped these rumours were false, that Thrall was nowhere near wherever they were about to search for him. And two, overwhelming relief, which was the same thing she felt every time Blackmore left Dernhold Keep. She then went out for her daily stroll, letting her hair down. T'was unseemly for a woman to prance about with unbound hair, but she didn't give a shit. However, as she gleefully combed her fingers through her Goldilocks, her gaze fell upon the welts on her wrists, which she instinctively tried to cover up. But, no, this wasn't her shame to hide. She then made her way to the cave, where she'd said her farewells to Thrall, and stood in there for a bit, feeling relieved and saddened at the same time. She desperately missed Thrall, missed writing to him, reading his kind, wise replies. If only the rest of her people could see that the orcs were not a threat anymore. Why was it so hard to understand that with a little bit of education and respect, orcs could be valuable allies? All that money and time being poured into the internment camps. It all seemed so dumb. After a while, Teresa made her way back, and as she did, she heard a loud blow of a horn. Yeah, great. Her master was back. And in that moment, any sense of lightness and freedom immediately bled out of her. Thrall was free, but her days of slavery loomed numberless ahead of her. And back with the orcs. A word, my lord. Go on. Humans are beginning to scour the forest, led by a loud, arrogant man in green. Blackmore. Jesus, was that man ever going to piss off? As I suspected. My lord, the stranger thrall has put us all in danger. If they find our caves, they'll have us at their mercy. We'll either be killed or rounded up like sheep. Neither shall happen, Regshak. Thrall has not put us in danger. It was my decision to let him stay. Do you question that? No, my chieftain. There was an awkward silence for a brief moment. Thank you. But Rekshak is right. I should leave. I'll go and make sure I leave a trail for them to follow. One that leads them far from you and yet not to me. We need you, Thrall, to liberate our brothers in the camps. Winter is coming. It'll be hard to feed an army. And there's something else I have to do first. You said you knew my clan. The Frost Wolves. I have to find them. Only then will I be ready to stand by your side. I had hoped to go in the spring, but seems Blackmore's forced my hand. Elscream stared for quite a while, and then nodded. You've a wise head on your shoulders. I do not know for certain where the Frost Wolves dwell, but somehow I know in my heart that you'll find them. And so, the following morning, Thrall bade a reluctant farewell to his new friends, but before he left... Here, I want you to have this. Elscream lifted a bone necklace from his own neck. These are the remains of my first kill. I've carved my symbols in them. Any orc chieftain will know them. I'll lead the humans away from them. If you don't, no matter. We'll tear them limb from limb anyway. Both orcs laughed fiercely. Classic Hellscream. And then Thrall was off, initially taking a detour, veering off towards the village that he tried to steal some food from. He then left a whole bunch of clues that would make anyone believe he'd head south afterwards including traceable footprints, and a strip torn from his Frostwolf swaddling cloth. And once he was satisfied, he then turned his attention towards the Alterac Mountains. Somewhere, hidden within those jagged peaks, was the Frostwolf clan, and an answer to who he really was. It took Thrall several weeks to ascend to the Alterac Mountains. More than once, he was caught off guard by a snowstorm, and forced to burrow until it passed. And the further up the mountain he travelled, the slower his movements became, because it was bloody freezing. The Warsong clan had provided him with food, dried meat, but because this journey was taking so long, that ran out. So Thrall had also taken to eating leaves, 
and tree bark. So all in all, he was having a shit time and was understandably starting to despair. He had no idea if he was even going in the right direction, but he was determined to find the frost wolves or die trying. So he pushed on, putting one foot in front of the other until eventually his body couldn't do that anymore. So he toppled over and passed out. He's awake. Thrall opened his eyes to see an orc child staring right at him. Hi. The child laughed and scurried off. And then a very old orc approached with saggy jowls and very milky eyes with no pupils. <laughs> Thought you were going to die, young one. Sorry to disappoint you. Our honor code obliges us to help those in need. But it's always easier if our help proves ineffective. One less mouth to feed. Thrall was a little bit taken aback by this guy's voice and his rudeness, but chose to stay quiet. My name is Drek'thar. I am a shaman of the Frostwood and their protector. Who, might I ask, are you? For a brief moment, amusement rippled through Thrall. An old man and a blind one at that. The protector of the Frostwolves. What a load of bollocks. However, as Thrall tried to sit up, he was startled to find himself slammed back down again, as if from a giant unseen hand. I did not give you leave to rise. Answer my question, stranger. My name is Thrall. Thrall? Oh, a human word. And a word of subjugation at that. Yes, a word that means slave in their tongue. But I am a Thrall no longer. I escaped their chains. Again, Thrall tried to rise and was subsequently slammed back down again. Only this time, he saw Drek'thar's gnarled old hands twitch slightly. So this was the power of Shaman. Why did our wolves find you wandering in a blizzard? It's a long story. I've got time. Thrall laughed. He was starting to like this sassy old geezer. So he told his story. How Blackmore had found him as an infant, raised him, taught him how to fight and read. He spoke of Tarry's kindness of the listless orcs in the camps. And finally, Thrall spoke of meeting Hellscream. Hellscream was the one who told me the Frostwolves were my clan. He knew because of this cloth. Let me show you. Thrall then fell silent. He couldn't show Drek'thar anything. Bloke was blind. Give it to me. The pressure on Thrall's chest eased off, allowing him to sit up. So he quickly handed the cloth to the shaman, who took it with both hands and started fiddling about with it whilst murmuring softly to himself. Secret is a sacred rival. As I suspected, this is indeed the pattern of the frost wolves, woven by the hand of your mother. We thought you dead. You know my mother? My father? Who am I? You are the only child of Duratan, our former chieftain. A short while later, a hearty bowl of stew was provided. And I guess we're doing that thing they do in movies where people start a conversation in one room, do a bunch of stuff, and then continue the conversation in a completely different room. Your parents are the most honored of all the Frost Wolves. They left us on a dire errand many winters past, never to return. We did not know what had happened to them until now. The fibers in the cloth told me they were slain and you survived. Check that I could sense Thrall's doubt that a blanket had spoken to him. What was the errand that cost my parents their lives? I will tell you in time, perhaps. But now, you've put me in a difficult position, Thro. You come during the winter, the harshest season of all. As your clan members, we must take you in. But that does not mean you will be kept warm, fed, and sheltered without recompense. I don't expect anything. I'm strong. I can work, even teach you some of the ways of humankind, so you're better prepared to fight them. Drek'thar then held up a commanding hand, silencing Thrall's eager babble, and then leaned inquisitively towards the fire, as if that was speaking to him. The shaman then looked at Thrall, and then back at the fire, and then back at Thrall, and then back at the fire. Since your father left, I have been the leader of the Frost Wolves. I accept your offer of aid to the clan Thrall, son of Duratan. But you will have to earn your rank. Some more time passed, with Thrall becoming well and truly settled within the Frostwolf encampment, assisting with hunts, covering refuse pits, skinning animals, all of the things 
He did everything that was asked of him, without a word. One evening, he asked Drakthar about the link between wolves and orcs. He was aware of the concept of domesticating animals, but this seemed different, seemed deeper. The wolves are not tamed, not as you understand the word. They've come to be our friends because I invited them. It's part of being a shaman. We have a bond with things that are part of the natural world, and we always work in harmony with them. It is helpful to us to have the wolves as our companions, help us hunt, keep us warm, and in return we keep them well fed, treat their injuries, ensure their cubs need not fear the mighty wind eagles. We made a similar pact with the goats, though they're not as wise as the wolves. They give us their wool and milk. And we protect them. <laughs> and we protect them in return. All of these creatures are free to break the pact at any time. But in the last 30 years, none has done so. Thor was impressed. This shaman magic was potent indeed. You can live with other things though, right? Other than animals. I can call the snows, the winds, the lightning. The trees bend to my will when I ask. And the rivers flow where I ask them to. But if your power is so great, then why do you continue to live in such a harsh place? If what you're saying is true, then you could turn this barren mountain into a lush garden. Food would never be difficult to come by. Your enemies would never find you. And I would violate the primary agreement with the elements. And nothing would ever respond to me again. Drekthar's tone suggested that Thrall had caused some offense, which he most definitely felt guilty about. Do you understand nothing? Have the humans sunk their greedy talons into you so deeply? I am granted these things because I ask for them, with respect in my heart, and I'm willing to offer something in return. I request only the bearer's needs for myself and my people, and if I ask for more, it is only because the cause is good and just. In return, I thank these powers, knowing they are borrowed only never bought. They come to me because they choose to, not because I demand it. They are not slaves, Thrall. They are powerful entities who come of their own free will. For the next few days, Drekthar did not speak to Thrall, so he was definitely butthurt about that previous conversation. But Thrall continued to do his jobs. However, it wasn't just Drekthar. It seemed like the whole clan was growing more distant as time passed. Not closer like had been the case with the war songs. And one evening in particular... Slive. My name is Thrall. Thrall. Slive. Means the same thing. My wolf is ill. It's all its bedding. Clean it. Clean it yourself. I'm not your servant. I'm a guest. Oh, really? With a name like Slave? Here, human boy. Take it. The young orc threw the wolf's bedding, which covered Thrall before he could react. It smelled a piss, and Thrall absolutely lost his shit. He threw the blanket down and stepped angrily towards the little knob. I said, clean it. Ah! I had wondered how long it would take you. Surprised you even lasted this long. I turned on my hosts. I'm sorry, I'll leave. You will do no such thing. The first test was to see if you were too arrogant to ask to be one of us. Had you come in demanding the chieftainship as your birthright, we would have sent you away, and sent our wolves to make sure you stayed away. You needed first to be humble, before we would admit you. However, had you stayed servile for too long, had you not challenged Uthul's insults, you would not have been a true orc. I'm pleased to see that you are both humble and proud, Thrall. Drekthar then placed his hand on Thrall's shoulder. Both qualities are needed for one who will follow the path of the shaman. After passing Drekthar's little tests with flying colours, Thrall was truly accepted by the Frostwolf clan. Days were spent hunting with clan members, who now treated him like family, especially Uthal, despite the fact Thrall had punched him in the face, and nights were spent at loud happy gatherings, singing songs and telling tales. However, Despite Drekthar himself often regaling tales of the mighty Duratan, Thrall couldn't help but feel like the old orc was holding something back. He didn't press the matter though. He now trusted this old shaman completely. He had no doubt Drekthar would tell him what he needed to know, 
when he needed to know it. Also, during this time, Thrall made a new unique friend. One evening, as the clan gathered around a fire, a young wolf detached itself from the pack sleeping nearby and approached, and the frost wolf suddenly fell silent in anticipation. This female will choose. The old shaman rose and extended his arms towards the she-wolf. You wish to form a bond with one of our clan? Come forward. Choose the one with which you will be bonded for the rest of your life. The wolf remained a little bit tentative for a moment, taking her time, examining every orc present, until finally her eyes met with thralls, and she fell in love immediately, so she mooched right up to him and lay down by his side. Thrall felt a rush of kinship with the creature almost immediately, though he didn't really understand why. Didn't bloody know her, they'd just met. But somehow he knew that she would now be forever by his side until one of them left this world behind. So he patted the good girl on the head. The surrounding orcs all grunted in approval and started to clap. Tell us her name, Thrall. Snow Song. Cut to another day, one in which Drek'thar finally revealed some things. The snows were starting to melt now, due to the coming spring, so Drek'thar was performing a ritual, asking politely that the elements perhaps alter the course of things, only slightly, to ensure that the Frostwolf encampment did not become flooded. And as Thrall observed, he felt something stir, and heard a voice. We hear your request, and find it not unseemly. We shall not flow where you and yours dwell, shaman. Drek'thar bowed, and formally closed his ceremony, and then turned to face Thrall. I heard it. I heard the snow answer you. I know. It is a sign that you are ready, that you have learned and understand all that I have to teach. Tomorrow, you will undergo your initiation. But tonight, join me. I have things to say that you must hear. So, after darkness fell, Thrall entered Drek'thar's cave, and saw the old shaman sat waiting alongside his wolf, Wise Ear. Sit. You have many questions about your father and his fate. The time has come for me to answer them. But first, swear on all that you hold dear that you will never tell anyone else what I am about to tell you. Not unless you receive a sign that it needs to be said. I swear. You have heard that we were exiled by the late Gul'dan. But what you have not heard is why. No one knew the reason but your parents and myself. That was your father's wish. The fewer people who knew, the safer the clan. Thrall remained quiet, hanging on Drek'thar's every word. We now know that Gul'dan was evil, that he did not have the best interest of the Orc people in his heart. What most do not know is how deeply he betrayed us. What dreadful price we are now paying for what he did to us. Duratan learned, and for that knowledge he was exiled. He and Draka, and you, young Thrall, returned to the Southlands to tell the chieftain Orkham Doomhammer of Gul'dan's treachery. We do not know if your parents reached Doomhammer, but we do know that they were murdered for that knowledge. Drek'thar paused, and Thrall found himself getting a little bit antsy. What knowledge, he thought. Spit it out. Stop pausing for dramatic effect. Gul'dan only ever wanted power for himself, and sold us into a sort of slavery to achieve it. He formed a group called the Shadow Council, comprising of himself and many evil orc warlocks, and they dictated everything the orcs did. They united with demons, who gave them their vile powers, demons who infused the orcs with such a love of fighting and killing that our people forgot the old ways. We lusted only for death. You have seen the red fire in the eyes of orcs through. By that mark you know that they have been ruled by demon powers. Thrall gasped and immediately thought of Hellscream's bright scarlet eyes. How wasted his body was. Thrall then realised that Hellscream must face demons every single day and continues to resist them. So his respect and admiration for that guy grew immensely. I believe that the lethargy you reported seeing in the camps is withdrawn after being cut off from demonic energies. Without it, they feel weak, bereft. They are like empty cups, Thrall. They were once filled with poison. Now they cry out to be filled with something wholesome. That which they yearn for is the nourishment of the old ways. Shamanism. Only a reconnection with nature will rouse them from their stupor and remind them of the proud, courageous line from which we've all come. Again, Thrall stayed silent. Your parents knew of the dark bargain. They knew that this bloodthirsty horde was unnatural. 
So, we were banished, which your father accepted. But then you were born, through. And he knew he could no longer remain silent. He wanted a better world for you, his son. So now you know. Your parents headed south, as I told you, to find Orgrim Doomhammer. Doomhammer. I know that name. He was the war chief that led all the clans together, against the humans. He was wise and brave, a good leader of our people, though the humans were eventually victorious. Thanks again to Gul'dan's treachery. Was Doomhammer killed? We do not believe so. He's not been heard of since. But the odd rumor reaches us now and then. Some say he's become a hermit. Others that he's been taken prisoner. Many think of him as a legend that will return to free us when the time is right. And what do you think? Huh. <laughs> I think that I've told you enough. It's time for you to rest, Thrall. The morrow will bring your initiation, if it is meant to be. Best you be prepared. So, Thor got up, bowed respectfully, stood awkwardly for a moment, wondering why he just bowed respectfully to a blind man, and then buggered off. And once Drek'thar was confident the young orc was well and truly gone, he turned to his wolf. I have a task for you, my friend. You know what to do. Now, Thrall tried really hard to get some sleep, but he was too damned excited, and also apprehensive. Drek'thar had pretty much told him nothing about this initiation. He had no idea what to expect. So he was wide awake the entire night. The following morning, Thrall stepped outside and was surprised to see quite the crowd gathered waiting for him. But before he could ask what the bloody hell was going on, You are not to speak again until I give you leave. Depart at once to go alone into the mountains. You are not to eat or drink, but think hard upon the path in which you are about to set foot. When the sun has set, return to me, and the rite will begin. So Thrall did as instructed. The day itself passed surprisingly quickly, with Thrall returning to the encampment as soon as dusk fell to find Drek'thar waiting for him. The old orc then gestured for Thrall to follow, so he did, and the two of them then walked to a new area that Thrall had not seen before. This place has always been here, but it does not wish to be seen. Therefore only now, as it welcomes you, does it become visible. Thrall was starting to feel a little bit nervous now, but refrained from speaking. Drek'thar had not yet technically given him permission to talk, Stand in the center, Thrall. Prepare to meet the spirits of the natural world. Thrall's heart started to pound, but nothing happened. They waited. Nothing. Waited some more. Still nothing. Thrall started to feel impatient and somewhat angry. And then... Patience, patience is the first, first test. test. Thrall then inhaled swiftly. That voice. It was inside his head. I am the soil that yields the fruit. The grasses that feed the beasts. I am rock. The bones of this world. I am the spirit of Earth. Ask me. Ask you what? Thrall thought. Knowing the question is part of your test. Thrall panicked for a moment before collecting himself, and as he cleared his mind, a question formed clearly inside it. Will you lend me your strength and power when I need it? For the good of the clan and those we would aid? Thrall then felt a power rising inside him. It felt warm, cozy. However, it was not accompanied by the usual bloodlust. I have agreed to lend you my assistance. Honor me, and that gift shall always be yours. The power then receded, and Thrall found himself shaking a little bit, but he wasn't given much time to process it, because another voice then piped up. Thrall knew what to do this time, so he asked the same question, and again, a sensation of power filled him. This one lighter and freer. And that was the Spirit of Air's part done. Next, Thrall felt heat churning in his belly, with sweat forming on his brow. The Spirit of Fire was here. And again, he asked for its aid, and it responded. After that, his mind was filled with the vision of an ocean, despite the fact he'd never seen one before. The Spirit of Water, which also responded to his question. Thrall thanked each and every single one of the elements, and then turned to Drek'thar, but the Shaman shook his head. Your test is not yet completed. Another power then surged within Thrall, this one shaking him from head to toe. We are, we are the, the essence, essence of all things, things living, living, the most, most powerful, powerful of all. We, we are, are the spirit, spirit of the wilds. Speak, Speak Thrall. Thrall. Tell, Tell us why you why think you are worthy of our aid. Thrall could now not breathe. He was completely overwhelmed by the sheer power of this thing. 
He tried to force himself to focus, but it was bloody impossible and he fell to his knees. However, the pummeling then stopped, the spirits all calmed down, and in that moment, Thrall could sense that he'd been judged and found worthy. I had hoped that they would accept. The spirits, they were angry with us for our dark bargain. There are only a few shaman left now, all as old as I. The spirits were waiting for someone worthy. You are the first in a long, long time to be so honoured, and I am not surprised. I've never seen a stronger shaman in my life, and you are only just beginning. With the spirits of earth, air, fire, water, and the wilds as his willing companions, Thrall now felt stronger than ever, especially after Drek'thar gave him a little bit of extra guidance, teaching him what the Elder referred to as calls. The warlocks would term them spells, but we, shaman, term them simply calls. We ask, and the powers we work with answer, or not, as they will. Have they ever not answered? Yes. When? Why? Unless you don't want to talk about it. You are a shaman now. It is right that you understand our limitations. I am ashamed to admit that I asked for improper things more than once. The first time, I asked for a flood to destroy an encampment of humans. I was angry and bitter. They had destroyed many of our clan, but there were many wounded, even women and children in that place, and the spirit of water refused. But floods happen all the time. Many innocents die, and it serves no purpose. It serves the spirit of water's purpose, and the wilds. I do not know their needs and plans. They certainly do not tell me of them. Throw considered that for a moment. What about the other times? <sighs> you probably assume that I've always been old, guiding the clan spiritually. <laughs> no one is born old, wise one. Sometimes I wish I had been. I was once young, as you are, and the blood flowed hot in my veins. I had a wife and child. They died in a battle against humans. No, nothing so noble. They fell ill. All my pleas to the elements were to no avail. I raged in my grief, demanded that the spirits return the lives that they had snatched, and they grew angry with me. For many years they refused to hear my calls. Because of my arrogance to demand that my loved ones come back to life, many others of the clan suffered. It's only natural to want your loved ones to stay alive, Master Drakthar. Why would the spirits not understand that? Oh, they understood. My first request was humble. The element listened with compassion before it refused. But my next request was a furious demand, and the spirit of the wilds was offended, for I had abused the relationship between shaman and element. It is more than likely you will endure the pain of losing loved ones through. The spirit of the wilds has reasons for doing what it does. You must respect those reasons. Thrall nodded, but he didn't absolutely agree. Drakthar shouldn't have been blamed for raging at the spirits in a time of torment. But that was probably a good time to change the subject. Where's Wizir? He's a companion, not a slave. He leaves when he wishes, returns when it is his will. As if to reassure him, Snow Song then booped her nose on Thrall's leg, and he patted her on the head. He then bade his teacher good night, and off he went to sleep in his own cave. More time passed, with Thrall hunting and helping and all of that sort of stuff. Only now, he could utilise his newfound relationship with the elements, and they came in handy. Earth would often provide advice on where herds were located. Air could change the course of the wind, so that Thrall's scent wouldn't alert his intended prey. However, there was only one occasion where Thrall asked for the Spirit of the Wild's aid. Supplies had become dangerously low, and the clan's luck in hunting had taken a turn for the worse. There were signs that deer were in the area, like deer poop, but the sneaky little buggers had continued to elude them for days. So, Thrall closed his eyes and extended his mind. Spirit of the Wilds, I ask for your favour. I ask for you, Spirit of the Deer, to sacrifice yourself. We will not waste any of your gifts, and we will honour you. Many lives depend on the surrendering of one. The orc then opened his eyes, only to see a white stag standing right in front of him, which inclined its head, and then it bounded away, 
skippity skipping off at a rapid pace. Follow me. Soon enough, the Frostwolf hunting party arrived at a clearing to discover a large stag lying on the ground, with one of its legs bent at a very disgusting angle. And Thrall immediately approached it. Do not fear. Your pain will soon be ended. Your life continues to have meaning. I thank you, brother, for your sacrifice. Ah! After a few more weeks of hunting and gardening and shamaning, Thrall made his way back from gathering some herbs, only to discover the Frostwolf clan had a new guest. A large orc wearing a cloak. Who's the stranger? A wandering hermit. We do not know him. He says that Wisir found him lost in the mountains and led him here. Seems like you've received him with more kindness than you received me. He comes only asking for refuge for a few days before pressing on. He didn't come with a torn Frostwolf swaddling cloth asking to be adopted. And he comes at springtime, not the onset of winter. These were all fair points, Thrall thought. He then sat down. Greetings, stranger. How long have you been traveling? Longer than I care to recall, young one. I'm in your debt. I had thought the Frost Wolves only a legend, told by Gul'dan's cronies to intimidate all other orcs. Clan loyalty then stirred inside Thrall. We were banished wrongly. Proved our worth by making a life for ourselves in this harsh place. To my understanding, that not so long ago you were as much a stranger to this clan as I. They've spoken of you, young Thrall. I hope they've spoken well. <laughs> well enough. The Hooded Orc continued to eat his bowl of stew. What's your own clan, friend? The Hooded Orc then stopped eating his bowl of stew. I have no clan now. I wander alone. Were they all killed? Killed. Taken. Dead where it counts. I don't want to talk about him. Thrall inclined his head. This bloke was making him feel uncomfortable. And suspicious. Something wasn't right about him. So he rose and walked back to Drakthar. We should watch him. There's something about him I don't like. So we were wrong to suspect you when you came, yet you're the only one who suspects this hungry stranger. Thrall, you have so much yet to learn. Despite Drakthar's words, Thrall continued to watch the stranger all bloody day. Guy had a sack he didn't let anyone touch. Not once had he taken off his bulky cape. Every time he was asked a question, he replied very briefly, and revealed very little about himself. A whole day, and all Thrall knew about the guy was he'd been a hermit for twenty years, nursed dreams of the old days, and yet appeared to be doing very little to actually help bring them back. Have you ever seen the internment camps? Thrall says the orcs in prison there have lost their will. Well, that's no surprise. There's little to fight for anymore. There's much to fight for. Freedom? A place of our own? And yet you frost wolves hide up here in the mountains. As you hide in the southlands? Yeah. But I don't purport to rouse the orcs to revolt against their masters, do I? Now Thrall was really pissed off. I will not be here long. Soon I'll rejoin the undefeated orc chieftain Grom Hellscream. We're going to storm the camps. Inspire our brethren to rise up against the humans. Rise up against bullies who keep them against their will. Thrall was really expecting Drakthar to chide him for his outburst, but the elder shaman said nothing. Grom Hellstream, a demon-ridden dreamer. Listen, your frost wolves have the right of it. As do I. I've seen what the humans can do. Best to avoid them. Seek the hidden places they don't go. I was raised by humans. Believe me, they are not infallible. Nor are you. Coward. Thrall! No, Master Drexel. I will not be silent. He comes seeking our aid, eats at our fire, and dares to insult the courage of our clan and his own race. I'll not stand for it. I may not be the chieftain, but I will claim my individual right to fight this stranger. Again, what Thrall expected to happen did not. He expected the stranger to cringe and ask his pardon. But the guy just laughed got up to reveal that he was, in fact, as big as Thrall was, opened his sack, and pulled out the biggest bloody warhammer Thrall had ever seen. See if you can take me then, whelp. The Frost Wolves all backed away. What the hell was happening, Thrall thought. Even Drakthar seemed to just be sitting there silent and impassive. Uthor then passed Thrall a spear, and he began to stomp his feet. He could sense the spirit of Earth responding questioningly, being all like, This isn't really anything to do with me, mate. 
So Thrall, very carefully so as not to upset the elements, refused their aid. This was not their fight. But still, the earth did tremble a little bit as Thrall stamped his feet, which at first startled the stranger before he then looked oddly pleased. And then, the two orcs leapt at each other and proceeded to beat each other up for about five paragraphs or something. Until eventually, Thrall managed to seize the stranger's hammer from him and then use it to smash the bloke right in the face. Thrall then pinned the guy down on the ground, only to then be dragged off by no less than eight of his fellow Frostwolves. The bloodlust and red haze then faded as Thrall took several deep breaths, a little bit confused as to why the Frostwolves had jumped in and ended the battle. Long has it been since anyone could even challenge me. It's been even longer since anyone could best me. Only your father ever did that. Elstream was right about you. Appears I've found my second in command. Second in command? I beat you, stranger, with your own weapon. I know not what code makes the victor second. Thrall! It's fine. He doesn't understand yet. Thrall, son of Duratan, I've come a long way to find you, to see if the rumours were true, that there was yet a worthy second in command for me to take under my wing and trust in when I liberate the encampments. The stranger then paused, with his eyes a-twinkling. My name is Orgrim Doomhammer. Thrall's face immediately dropped as he realised he'd just insulted and punched a legend. Most noble Doomhammer, I ask your forgiveness. I didn't know. My teacher might have warned me. Again, Doomhammer just laughed. That would have spoiled everything. I wanted to pick a fight. See if you indeed had the passion and pride of which Hellscream spoke so glowingly. I got more than a bargain for. I got beaten. Doomhammer's whole demeanour suggested that this was the funniest thing that had ever happened to him. Which in turn caused Thrall to relax somewhat. Come Thrall, sit with me. We'll finish our meal and you'll tell me your story. And I'll tell you tales of your father you've never heard. And so, the scene reset, with everyone sitting back down in the positions they'd been prior to the fight. Drakthar confessed that he had indeed known who this stranger was all along. He'd sent Wyzir out to fetch the bloke. The orcs then enjoyed a large feast, as well as a bit of song and dance, and Thrall told Doomhammer his story. This Blackmoor, he sounds like Gul'dan. One who does not have the best interests of his people in his heart. Only his own profit and pleasure. I wasn't the only one to experience his cruelty. He hates orcs, but he has no love for his own people either. And this Teretha and Sergeant. I didn't know humans were capable of kindness and honour. I wouldn't know honour or mercy had it not been for Sergeant. It's been my experience that the males hate our people. The females and children fear us. Yet this girl child befriended you of her own will. Teretha has a good heart. I can give her no higher compliment than to say I'd be proud to admit her into my clan. She has an orc spirit. Doomhammer then fell silent for a moment. I've kept to myself for many years, since our defeat. I know what they say about me. I'm a hermit, a coward, afraid to show my face. Do you know why I've scorned the company of others for so long, Thrall? Thrall did not know, so he just shook his head. I needed to be by myself, to think, to remind myself who I was, who we all were, as a people. From time to time I'd do as I've done this night, venture forth to campfires, accept their hospitality, listen to their experiences. I know the inside of human prisons, as you do. I was captured, kept as an oddity of King Terran as a lorder on for a time. I was even in an encampment at one point. I know what it's like to be that broken, that despairing. I almost became one of them. Doomhammer had spent his entire monologue staring into the fire, but at this point, he turned to face Thrall. Well, I didn't. I escaped, just as you did. Found it easy, just as you did. And yet it remains difficult for those huddled in the mud in those encampments. We can only do so much from the outside. If a pig loves her stall, the open door means nothing. Thrall sort of understood what Doomhammer was trying to say. Tearing down the walls alone will not ensure our people's freedom. We need to remind them of the way of the shaman. Rid their contaminated spirits of the poison of demon whispered words. He won the admiration of the Warsong clan and their leader Thrall. Now you have the Frostwolves, ready and willing to follow you into battle. If there's any orc living who can teach our broken kin to remember who they are, 
It's you. Thru then thought about the encampment, how depressing it was, seeing all the orcs sitting in their own shit. Though I despise the place, I'll willingly return. But you must know that my capture is something that Blackmore deeply desires. Twice, I've only narrowly escaped him. I had hoped to lead a charge against him, but... But that would fail without troops. I know these things, Thru. I may have been a lone wanderer for a while, but I'm not completely oblivious to what's been happening in the land. Don't worry. We'll lay false trails for Blackmore and his men to follow. The commanders of the camps know to look for me. They'll be looking for large, powerful, spirited intelligence, Thru. Another defeated, broken, battered orc would go unnoticed. Can you hide that stubborn pride, my friend? It'll be difficult, but I'll do it. If it'll help my people. Spoken like the true son of Doritan. Doomhammer's voice sounded oddly thick, and Thrall hesitated for a moment, but he had to know. Drek'thar said that Joratan and Draka left to seek you, to convince you of Gul'dan's evil. I was alone with the bodies of two orcs and a white wolf when Blackmore found me. Did... did my father find you? He did. It's my greatest shame and sorrow that I didn't keep him closer. They came, told me of Gul'dan's treachery, and I believed them. I knew of a place where they'd be safe, or so I thought. But I later learned that several of my warriors were Gul'dan's spies. Duratan was my friend. I'd gladly have given my life for him and his family. Yet I unwittingly caused their deaths. I can only hope to atone for that by doing everything I can for the child he left behind. You come from a proud and noble line, Thrall. Despite the name you've chosen to keep. Let us honour that line. Together. A few weeks later, Thrall and Doomhammer put their plan into action because they don't mess around. Thrall lumbered into a village, roared at a bunch of farmers, and then let himself be captured. He was then taken, as expected, to an encampment, the whole time being careful not to give himself away, putting on his best impression of a broken crackhead orc. And, after keeping a low profile within the encampment for a bit, Thrall began the next stage of the plan. Approaching the other orcs, talking to them, singling out any that still seemed like they might have a bit of fight left. Thrall then informed those he'd singled out of their origins, he spoke of the powers of the shamans, of his own skills, and understandably, those orcs thought he was full of shit. He was going to need to prove his words. Now Thrall couldn't call down lightning, or cause the earth to shake. That would draw a bit too much attention. So, instead, he grabbed a clump of mud, held it aloft, and the few orcs around him gasped in awe, as grasses and even flowers sprouted forth from it. Even that which appears dead and ugly has power and beauty. The plan was coming together. The orcs all stared with the faintest glimmer of hope in their eyes. All this rebellion needed now was a spark. Thrall waited a few more days, allowing Doomhammer enough time to play his part in all this. If everything was going smoothly, both clans and Doomhammer should now be somewhere nearby, outside the camp, waiting for a signal. And so, finally, in the early hours of one particular morning, Thrall decided the time was nigh. He knelt down in the soil and began his call to the spirits of water and fire asking them politely and respectfully for aid in freeing his people. And sure enough, they answered. First came the rain, and then the lightning, jagged lines crashing down from the sky one after another, and that was followed by a cry that Thrall would recognise anywhere. Grom Hellscream. The cry startled the other orcs around Thrall, but he quickly reassured them. Those are our allies. They've come to free us. Guards then started to emerge from their tents, desperately scrambling to their posts in a panic. However... Can you feel it stirring? Can you feel your spirits longing to fight? To be free? Come, my brothers and sisters. Thrall then charged forward, desperately hoping the orcs behind him chose to follow, hoping that all of this would be enough to finally rouse their spirits. And sure enough, although the group of imprisoned orcs froze at first, one of them then startled himself with a loud yell and burst forward, and the rest moved soon after. A short while later... Ha <laughs> ha! Success! You're free, my brethren! You're free! The liberated orcs sat around the fire and cheered, and Thrall couldn't help but get a little bit choked up about it. This was the greatest day of his life. Meanwhile again... If you bear the news I think you do, then I'm inclined to separate your head from your shoulders. The hapless messenger from one of the internment camps looked at Blackmore, with a face that suggested he wished he was anywhere else but here right now. Uh... Um... Let me guess... There's been another uprising. All the orcs have escaped, and no one knows where they are. 
The young messenger just stood there, stammering, very much wanting his head to not be separated from his shoulders. For goodness sake, boy, speak! There's... there's more, sir. More? How much more can there possibly be? They identified the instigator, sir. It was Doomhammer, yes. I've heard the rumours. No, my lord. The leader of these rebellions. It's Thrall. The blood then visibly drained from Blackmore's face. You're a damned liar, boy. Or at least you'd better tell me you are. Nay, my lord. My master said he fought him. Remembered him from the gladiator battles. Well, then I'll have your master's tongue for telling such untruths. Be difficult, sir. He died an hour after. Blackmore then sank back into his chair, trying to compose his thoughts. A quick drink would help, he thought. But then everyone would judge him. Drunken fool, they'd say. No, I'm Aedilus Blackmore, Lord of Durnhold, Master of the Encampments. I trained that green-skinned freak. I can outthink him. I just need one drink to steady my hands, that's all. An odd sensation of pride then hit Blackmore. He was right about Thrall's potential all along. He really was something special. Hell, if he hadn't spurned the chances Blackmore had given him, he could be leading the charge against the Alliance right now. Bloody fool. Perhaps that beating that Blackmore had given him, perhaps that had been a bit too much. Nah, chat shit get hit. Blackmore wasn't going to feel guilty about educating a disobedient slave. Thrall was the bad guy here, throwing everything away just to ally with some stinky worthless thugs. Blackmore's attention then returned to the messenger. The lieutenant general then grabbed a quill and some parchment with his shaky alcoholic hands and started to scribble and then handed the finished missive to the trembling youngster. Take this to your master and have a care for that neck of yours, young sir. The messenger bowed and cheesed it before this pissed up maniac could change his mind. Damn it! Yes, sir. Go find Langston. I have a task for him to complete. Thrall successfully managed to liberate three encampments. With each liberation, security was somewhat increased, but still remained pretty pathetic. However, it was during the third infiltration that Thrall had been recognised. So Hellscream and Doomhammer decided it was probably a little bit too risky for the young orc to continue to pose as just another prisoner. It's your spirit, my friend, that's roused us. You can't continue to put yourself in such jeopardy. Well, I'm not just going to sit back and let everyone else face the danger. We're not suggesting that. It's the tactic that needs changing. Thrall then considered this for a moment, drawing upon his experiences living and training amongst humans. Humans talk. Gossip. We'll do it right in front of an orc, believing him to be too stupid to understand. Our captured kin will no doubt have heard about other camps being free. Even if they don't care to listen, they'll still know something's afoot. Maybe I don't have to be there physically. Maybe our message has already got through. All we need to do is clear the way. And so, <coughs> just as Thrall had hoped, their message had indeed reached the orcs imprisoned within. Clearing the way was now enough. Enough of a push for captured orcs to find their own paths to freedom. Unfortunately, with the new horde growing quite significantly, a new problem arose. One that Thrall hadn't expected. Small groups of orcs had started taking it upon themselves to storm nearby towns, killing many unarmed humans in the process. We're not butchers of humans. Our opponents are armed soldiers, not milkmaids and children. Ah, whatever you goddamn puss. <laughs> Forest teams with deer and hare. Every camp we liberate provides us with food. There is no need to terrorize people for our own amusement. You fight where I tell you to fight. And if any orc ever offers harm to an unarmed human again, I will not forgive it. Is that understood? The small group of orcs murmured a bit, but nodded. So Thrall softened his tone. Such behavior is of the old horde, led by dark warlocks who had no love for our people. That is what brought us to the internment camps, to the listlessness caused by a lack of demon energy of which we fed so greedily. That way almost destroyed us. We are free to be who we truly are. And who we are is much more than a race of beings who exist to slaughter humans. The old way is no more. We fight as proud warriors now, and there is no pride in murdering children. Thrall then turned and left, with nothing but stunned silence behind him. But he then heard a rumble of laughter up ahead. You walk a hard path, 
It's in their blood to kill. I don't believe that. I believe we were corrupted. Puppets, whose strings were pulled by demons, and those of our own people who betrayed us. It's a dreadful dance. Grumhell screamed, then approached. To be used, so. The power they give. It's like the sweetest honey. Be fortunate to have never drunk from that well, through. To be without it. It's almost unbearable. And yet you continue to do so, brave one. My courage is nothing compared to yours. Hellscream's red eyes glowed in the darkness, but Thrall could see that his kind words had made the orc smile. A few hours later, the new horde led by Doomhammer, Thrall and Hellscream made their way to the fifth encampment, because as I said before, these guys don't mess around. The guards are alert, almost double the usual number posted on the walls. They've lit many fires so that their weak eyes can see. And it's full moon's light. The white lady and blue child are not our friends tonight. We have to move now. Strike whilst the horde's still strong enough to resist the demon's listlessness. Doomhammer nodded, but he was still quite concerned. Any sign that they're expecting an assault? Thrall knew that sooner or later their luck was going to run out. They'd been careful, selected camps at random, but even still, Blackmore wasn't a complete dumbass. However, the scout shook their head in answer to Doomhammer's question. Then let us descend. And so, the green tide of orcs flooded down the hill towards the encampment, but just before they reached it, the gates flew open, with dozens of armed mounted humans charging out. Spirit of the Wilds, the humans are using your children to kill us. They too are in danger. If the horses throw their riders, they'll be free to reach safety. Will you ask them to do so? These children are trained to fight. They do not fear swords or spears. But there is no need for them to die today. We are only trying to free our people. It is a just cause, and not worth their deaths. The Spirit of the Wilds considered Thrall's words for a moment, and then absolute hilarious chaos broke loose. Spirit of Earth, trees who have sheltered us, will you aid me now? Yeah, all right. All right. Roots then exploded from the ground, seizing the dismounted guards, and to Thrall's approval, the orcs did not kill the helpless CC'd buggers. Instead, they focused on the new wave of guards that were now flooding out of the camp. Thrall then decided now was a good time to fight as a warrior. The elements had provided enough aid, it would be rude to ask for more, so he went ahead and charged. Meanwhile, Lord Caramin Langston had never been so afraid in his entire life. He was too young to have fought in the Second War, so when his idol, Lord Blackmore had stated that fighting orcs was a piece of piss. He'd believed him. But Blackmore had said nothing about their terrifying battle cries. The stench of blood and shit. The images of humans being dismembered. They'd had the element of surprise, Langston thought. They'd been ready for the green monsters. Why the bloody hell had the horses gone mental? What wicked sorcery had made roots come flying out of the ground? But, as Langston stood there, frantically and desperately waving his sword around, he got zero answers. To any of these questions. And then, for a fleeting second, his eyes met those of his attacker, and his mouth dropped open in shock. Thrall? Thrall's eyes widened in recognition, and then narrowed in fury, and then... Thrall then slung the now unconscious captain over his shoulder and hurried back outside the walls, dropping the bloke like a sack of spuds near an ancient oak tree. He then quickly asked the tree politely to guard the bloke, before turning round and heading back. He spent the next few paragraphs searching, urging any orc prisoners he could find to cheese it. And finally, once he was certain that all the camp inhabitants had fled, he returned to the battle itself. He could see Hellscream fighting with all the power and passion of a demon, but where was Doomhammer? The charismatic war chief would have normally called for retreat at this point. As second in command, Thrall then made that call himself, rushing from warrior to warrior, screaming the words retreat. And as soon as the last one was sprinting up the hill, Thrall decided to be rude and asked the spirit of Earth for one more thing. And Earth responded. The ground beneath the encampment began to tremble and heave, and the air filled with screams of genuine terror. And then, silence. <sighs> Thank you. However, Hellscream then hastily approached. It's Doomhammer. You better hurry. Thrall felt a pit in his stomach, but went ahead and followed Hellscream. And as they pushed through the crowd... Thrall saw a sight which absolutely horrified him. There was Doomhammer, 
propped against a tree with a spear that had pierced right through his torso. It was a coward's blow. I was struck from behind. My lord. Doomhammer waved Thrall to silence. Listen, I need your help, Thrall. In two things. First, you must carry on what we've started. I led the Horde once, but it's not my destiny to do so again. Take my armor, carry my hammer, become war chief. Thrall, I could not have hoped for a better heir. Your father would be so proud. It's shame enough that I die from a coward's strike. I'll not leave my life with this piece of human treachery stuck in my body. I've tried to pull it out myself, but please, Thrall, do this for me. Thrall felt absolutely crushed, but nodded. He then closed his fingers around the tip of the spear and steeled himself against the pain that he knew he was about to cause his friend and mentor. Pull! Thrall pulled, all whilst Doomhammer made heartbreaking noises. Black red blood then gushed freely from the fatal hole in Doomhammer's sternum. I saw it happen. He was single-handedly battling eight of them. It's the bravest thing I've ever seen. Thrall nodded, fighting back tears. Great leader. I'm afraid. I'm not worthy to wear your armor or wield your weapon. No one breathes who's worthier. You will lead them to victory. To peace. Doomhammer's eyes then closed and his lifeless body went limp. They are watching, Thrall. They must not lose heart. Show them that they have a new chieftain. And so, holding his grief back and putting on a brave face, Orgrim Doomhammer has named me War Chief. It is a title I would not have sought, but I have no choice. Who will follow me to lead our people to freedom? A cry then rose from the crowd filled with grief for the passing of their leader, but also with the sound of hope as well. Fueled by grief and anger, Thrall marched right up to where he dropped Lord Langston. I should kill you. Mercy, Lord Thrall! When did you show me mercy? When did you intervene to say Blackmore? Perhaps you've beaten him enough. When did those words cross your lips? I wanted to. Right now you believe those words, but I have no doubt that you never truly felt that way. Let us dispense with lies. Your life has value to me, for the moment. If you tell me what I want to know, I'll release you, and let you return to your dog of a master. Langston looked somewhat doubtful of that. You have my word. Of what worth is the word of an orc? Why, it's worth your pathetic life, Langston. Though I'll grant you that's not worth much. Now, tell me, how did you know which camp we'd be attacking? Langston crossed his arms, like a sulky douchebag child, so Thrall formed a thought, causing tree roots to burst out of the ground and grip the bugger tightly. Yeah, the trees obey my command, as do all the elements. We didn't know. It's just Blackmore's put knights at all the remaining camps. So no matter where we struck, we would have encountered his men. Hardly a good use of resources. What else can you tell me? What's he been doing to ensure my capture? How many troops does he have? Again, Langston tried to refuse to answer, so Thrall asked the Roots to squeeze the bloke even tighter. Oh, he desperately wants you back, Thrall. You were the key to everything. What are you talking about? When he found you, he knew he could use you. Didn't you ever wonder why he taught you how to read? Gave you maps? Taught you strategy? It's because he wanted to lead an army. An army of orcs. Thrall's anger then started to rise. You're lying. Why would he want me to lead his rivals? Because they wouldn't be his rivals. You'd lead an army of orcs against the Alliance. Thrall then stood there, his mouth agape. He'd always known Blackmore was a dick, but this... This was treachery on a staggering level. You were the best of both worlds. The power, strength and bloodlust of an orc, combined with the intelligence and knowledge of a human. With you in command, the orcs would be invincible. An aidless Blackmore would be what? King? Lord of everything? Langston nodded, furiously. You can't imagine what he's been like since you escaped. It's been hard on all of us. Hard? I was beaten and made to think I was less than nothing. I face death nearly every day in the arena. I and my people are battling for our very lives. For freedom. That, Langston, is hard. Do not speak to me of pain. 
and difficulty, for you've known precious little of either. Langston fell silent, and Thrall started to ponder everything he'd just learned. It was a bold and audacious strategy, but Aedilus Blackmore was a bold and audacious man. But if his aim had been to win Thrall's complete and utter loyalty, why did he treat him like shit? However, Thrall then started to recall that Blackmore had not always been a dick. There'd been moments, here and there, where the bloke had been more open, almost fatherlike. Hell, Thrall had adored the man, right up until the moment he was done with him. After that point, all Thrall had really thought about were the times when Blackmore had been mean, or brutal, slurring his words and acting like a real obnoxious twat. And it was in that moment where Thrall finally understood. He'd been too young to piece it together back at Durnhold, but the bloke was an alcoholic, addicted to a toxic substance that made him feel powerful, not unlike the orcs. I keep my word. You and your men can leave, but with no weapons, no food, and no mounts. You'll be followed, but you will not see who follows you. If you speak of an ambush, or attempt any kind of attack, you will die. Is that understood? Again, Langston nodded furiously, so Thrall asked the roots to unsqueeze. The man then got up, brushed himself off, and scrambled away. Thrall then looked up at an owl hanging about in the tree, minding its own business. Follow them, my friend, if you will. Report back if they plan action against us. <laughs> A short time later, Thrall and the rest of the orcs had gathered up the bodies of the fallen and had built several pyres, the largest and most decorated of which belongs to Orgrim Doomhammer. And after a few moments of solemn, respectful silence and mourning, Hellscream went ahead and nudged Thrall subtly, informing him he should probably say a few words. So he turned to address the crowd. I've not been long in the company of my own people. I don't know the traditions of the afterlife, but I do know this. Doomhammer died bravely, in battle, trying to liberate his imprisoned kin. We honor him now in death, as we all honored him in life. Orgrim Doomhammer, you were my father's best friend. I could not hope to know a nobler being. Speed now, my friend, to whatever joyous place and purpose await you. Another short while later, after the rite was done, Thrall, Hellscream, and Drek'thar sat down together to discuss what was next. Orgrim Doomhammer may be gone, but what he stood for could never be forgotten. What encampment is next, my war chief? Thrall winced at the title. He was still getting used to that. No more encampments. Our force is large enough now. For what? Thrall. To cut off the head of the snake. We storm Durenhold and liberate all the camps at once. Meanwhile, I told him nothing, of course. He captured and tortured me, but I held my tongue. He let us go out of sheer admiration. Right. Tell me more about these feats he performs. And so, Langston regaled the tale of the horses going mental, the lightning strikes, all the different things that happened involving roots. And Blackmore listened, feeling more and more proud of himself because apparently Thrall's command of the elements was all thanks to him. I fear others were not likely as staunch as you in the face of torture, my friend. They all slightly know the truth. We need to think like Thrall. What's his next move? What's his goal? Now the atmosphere around Durnhold had changed somewhat of late. Everyone around the keep had heard news of Thrall's exploits, and people were discussing it here, there and everywhere. Blackmore's drinking had grown completely and utterly out of control, but that actually turned out to be a good thing for Teresa Foxton, because more often than not, her master was just passed out somewhere leaving her able to go off and do whatever the hell she wanted to do. In this moment, she was on her regular daily trip out into the woods, off to check that tree she told Thrall about. She checked it pretty much every day, just in case Thrall had ever placed her necklace inside. He never had, though. However, on this day, as she peered through the hole of the stump, she gasped. Tears of joy then filled her eyes and spilled down her face cheeks. There it was, her silver necklace, Tonight, she'd be able to see her long-missed almost brother. And so, she skipped back to Durnhold, happier than she'd been in a very long time. Several hours later, which to Teresa felt like they dragged immensely, you seem a bit preoccupied, my dear. You were right. 
Both Tamis and Clania Foxton looked at their daughter with extreme concern on their faces, their concern being that Teretha was pregnant with Blackmore's child. Ain't nobody got time for that. And although she wished she could reassure her parents, Teretha then spied an opportunity. I'm fine, da. This fish, though, does it taste all right to you? Tastes well enough. Teretha then prodded the fish on her plate with her fork for a bit, before dramatically forcing herself to take another bite. She then immediately pushed her plate away. I'm sorry. And then she got up and ran out of the room, making exaggerated heaving noises whilst rushing upstairs. She then entered her own chambers, making even more vomity noises, and sure enough, there was an urgent knock on her door. Darling, poor dear, you look pale as milk. Typical mother, Teresa thought. Here I am faking all of this and you still think I look pale. Can da have a word with master? I don't think... Clania then turned bright pink. Everyone knew that Teresa was Blackmore's mistress, but they never spoke of it. Yeah, yeah. You can stay with us tonight. No, um, no, it's it's fine, mother. I'd just like to be alone for a bit. All right, Petal. Good night. Let us know if you need anything. Clania then exited, closing the door behind her, and Teresa breathed a sigh of relief. Now all she had to do was wait for a bit, until it was safe to leave. Unfortunately, her chambers were right next to the kitchens, which were one of the last places within the keep to settle down for the night. But, as soon as all was still outside, Teresa ventured forth. Thrall was hard-pressed not to let out a shout of joy as he saw Teresa enter the cave. Teresa, are you well? Well enough. You? I wasn't sure if you were injured or hungry. I wasn't able to bring a great deal, but I brought what I could. Food, bandages. Terry, I don't want you to panic, but I didn't come alone. Thrall then gestured causing a whole bunch of figures to emerge from the shadows. And for a brief moment, fear flitted across Teresa's face. But that was then replaced with a smile and a curtsy. If you're friends with Thrall, then we're friends also. Teresa then extended her hand. <laughs> War Chief, no. We'll spare the females and young as you command, but we're not. Yes, you will. This human risked her life to free me. She's risking her life again to come to our aid now. Teresa can be trusted. She's different. The scouts exchanged glances with each other, shrugged, and then both shook Teresa's hand. We're grateful for what you've brought. I have no doubt they'll be needed. Terry's smile then faded somewhat. You intend to attack Dernholt? Not if it can be avoided. Tomorrow, my army will march to Dernholt, prepared to attack if needed. First, I'll give Blackmore the opportunity to talk to us. If he's willing to negotiate... We will not shed blood. All we want is to have our people freed. He'll never agree. He's too proud to think of what would be best for those he commands. Then stay here. With us. My people have orders not to attack the women and children. But in the heat of battle, I can't guarantee their safety. You'll be safer here. Thrall, if I'm discovered missing, then that will alert someone that something's going on. And my parents are still there. Thrall sighed unhappily. She had no idea what Chaos Battle brought, but she was her own person. Not bad. Risk your own personal safety to give us an opportunity to free our brothers. Guess the War Chief didn't lie. Some humans really do understand honor. The scout then bowed his respect to Teresa, and she smiled, turning back to Thrall. I know it sounds a bit foolish to say, but be careful. There's, there's some rumors that you've got powers, Thrall. Are they true? I don't know what you've heard. I learned the ways of the shaman. I can control the elements. And Blackmore can't possibly stand against you. Be merciful in your victory through. You know we're not all like him. Here. I want you to have this. Teresa then bowed her head, removing the silver necklace and re-gifting it back to Thrall again. You had it for so long, it's basically yours now anyway. Keep it. Give it to your child, if you have one. Perhaps I can visit them one day. Teresa then stepped forward and hugged Thrall. And this time, Thrall returned it, rather than just patting her on the head. And after that heartfelt goodbye, Teresa left, striding back towards Dernhold Keep. Only after she was well away from the Yorks did she permit the tears to come. 
She'd put on a brave face for Thrall, but she didn't want to die. She really hoped Thrall would be able to control his people, but she knew he was unique. Other orcs did not hold the same tolerant views that he did. Jaretha then arrived back at the keep, cautiously and stealthily making her way back to her quarters. However, well met, my traitor. We've been waiting for you. The following morning, Thrall, Hellscream, and a couple of Frost Wolves marched steadily towards Durnhold Keep. He'd ordered the army of nearly 2,000 orcs to hold back for now. They outnumbered Blackmoor's forces by about four to one, but now was not the time to be complacent, or the time to be aggressive. Thrall called a small songbird over, and asked it to have a little look-see ahead for them. And after a few moments, the songbird returned, and in Thrall's mind he heard a little voice say, Thrall frowned a little bit, before giving the little bird another order. Fly back to my army. Find the old blind shaman. Tell him what you've told me. And so, the songbird buggered off, to execute Thrall's request. Drekthar was an experienced warrior, so Thrall had no doubt he'd know what to do with that information. The small party then pressed on, following the road until eventually, Durnhold, in its proud stony glory, loomed ahead. And Thrall sensed a change in the group. Hold up the flag of truce. Act civil. That should prevent them from opening fire on us. We may have stormed the encampments with ease before, but now we face something much more difficult. Durnhold is a fortress. It will not be taken easily. But mark me, if negotiations fail, then Durnhold will fall. Please don't let it come to that, Thrall thought. But deep down, he knew it would. Thrall and his group then moved even closer. There was movement up on the walls, cannons facing directly towards them, archers taking up their positions as well as mounted knights now appearing from the gates, and then Aedlus Blackmore himself. Well, well, if it isn't my little pet orc all grown up. Greetings, Lieutenant General. I come not as a pet, but as a leader of an army. An army that's defeated your men soundly in the past. But I will make no move against them this day, unless you force my hand. Standing beside Blackmore was Caramin Langston, somewhat side-eyeing his mentor and looking extremely unsure about this entire situation. That's nice, Thrall. What did you have in mind? Blackmore was so drunk that he was swaying, and once again, pity warred with hatred in Thrall's heart. We have no desire to fight humans anymore, unless you force us to defend ourselves. But you hold many hundreds of orcs prisoner, Blackmore, in your vile encampments. They will be freed, one way or another. There is a way to do this without more unnecessary bloodshed. Willingly release them all, and we will return to the wilds and leave humans alone. At that, Blackmore just threw his head back and laughed. Oh, Thrall, you're better than the King's Jester. Thrall, slave. I swear it's more entertaining to watch you now than it was when you fought in the gladiator ring. Listen to you, using complete sentences. You think you understand mercy, do you? Langston then felt a tug at his sleeve, and he turned to see Sergeant with a very serious look on his face. I've no great love for you, Langston, but at least you're sober. Shut Blackmore up. Get him down from there. You've seen what the orcs can do. We can't just surrender. No, but we should at least send out men to talk to them. Buy some time for our allies to get here. Blackmore did send for reinforcements, didn't he? Unfortunately, with Blackmore standing right there, he then interrupted this little chat. Ah, Sergeant. Hey, look, Thrall, here's an old friend. Sorry you're still here, Sergeant. You've been too long away, Thrall. Convince Blackmore to release the orcs. And I swear on the honor that you taught me, none within these walls shall come to harm. Langston then piped up, nervously. My lord. Thrall had me, and he let me go. He kept his word. I know he's only an orc, but... You hear that, Thrall? You're only an orc. Even this idiot Langston says so. What kind of human surrenders to an orc? Aedlus then leaned forward, stumbling a little bit. Why did you do it, Thrall? I gave you everything. You and me. We'd have led those green skins of yours. Against the Alliance and all the food and wine and gold we could want. Langston stared, horrified. Blackmore had just announced their treachery in front of everybody. You hear that, men of Durnholt? 
Your lord and master would betray all of you. Rise up against him. Yield to us. And at the end of the day, you will still have your lives. And your fortress. However, nothing. No sudden stirring of rebellion. I ask you once more, Blackmore. Negotiate. Or die. Blackmore did his best to stand at his full height, and then picked up a small sack, and then tossed it over the wall towards Thrall. Here's my answer, Thrall. Confused, Thrall knelt down and opened the sack, and his face then dropped as he realised what was inside it. There were Teretha Foxton's sightless eyes, staring up at him from her severed head. That's what I do with traitors. That's what I do to people I love who betray me, who take everything and give nothing, who sympathise with double-damned orcs. Thrall couldn't hear Blackmore's moulding. All he could hear was thunder rolling in his ears. A red haze then flooded his vision, and then... The sky started to boil, with dozens of lightning strikes split in the clouds. The crashing thunder that followed caused many of the men up on the parapets to drop their weapons and fall to their knees. However, Blackmore just laughed. They said you couldn't be broken. Well, I broke you, Thrall. I broke you. Thrall stared up at Blackmore. Pity had lost the war within his heart now. Only hatred remained. The rage in his eyes being the first thing to actually get through to Blackmore. And it was in that very moment that Lieutenant General Aedalus Blackmore realised he'd done fucked up. Thrall, what are we doing? Thrall then picked himself up harnessing his powerful self-control, and then... What have you done? Sergeant grabbed Blackmore and started shaking him fiercely, but the bloke had completely lost it now, and was just laughing like a maniac. Screams filled the air as the walls and stone around them started to tremble, so Sergeant turned to Langston, who was kind of just rocking backwards and forwards. He's lost control. You're in command. What do you want to do? Sur sur surrender Too late for that. Blackmore's done us all in. We gotta fight for it now. Until Thrall decides he wants to talk peace again. If he ever does. So I ask again. What do you want to do? I would you like me to take command of the defence of Dernhold, sir? Langston looked up at the sergeant with grateful wet eyes and nodded. Right then. After spending a few moments stumbling about and falling over a number of times, Blackmore reached his quarters, and immediately head to his desk. With trembling fingers, he searched frantically for a key. A key to a secret passageway, an escape from the screams and savagery happening outside. Once he found it, he staggered over to a tapestry beside his bed, tore the weaving down, and inserted the key into a lock, and then plunged forward, completely forgetting about the stairs. Thrall's rage and the sudden onslaught by thousands of orcs might have felt like a sobering moment, but Aedless Blackmore was still very much inebriated, which was probably the main reason why he fell down the stairs, but also why he barely felt the fall at all. He then started to run through his secret escape tunnels, falling several more times. However, this time it wasn't just because he was pissed. The earth was trembling. No doubt Thrall's newfound superpowers. But, again... Blackmore picked himself up, coughed violently from the dust in the air, and stumbled further forward, until he turned a corner and saw nothing but a huge pile of rocks. The tunnel had collapsed, and at this point, the Lieutenant General fell intentionally to the ground, and started sobbing like a little girl. What the bloody hell was he going to do now? Well, there was only one choice, really. Blackmore then made his way back, crawling up the stairs and re-entering his quarters, only to find Thrall waiting for him. I can explain. No, you can't. There is no explanation. There is only battle, long in coming. A duel to the death. Come for me. Blackmore then lunged, a lot faster and more focused than Thrall had expected, but Thrall went ahead and parried the blow. It's still not too late, Thrall. Join with me. We can work together. Of course I'll free the orcs. You could all fight for me, under my banner. Shut up. Do you honestly believe I can forget the sight of- Just the thought 
of Teretha's severed head caused Thrall to see red again. He'd been holding back up to this point, giving Blackmore a fighting chance. But sod that, this prick dies now. So, Thrall lunged forward and just started absolutely pummeling the guy, landing blow after blow on Blackmore's increasingly broken and shattered face. And then it was over. Blackmore just lay, gasping, blood pouring out of him. He stared up at Thrall with glazed eyes, and to Thrall's astonishment, he smiled. You are what I made you. I'm so proud. And then he sagged, because he was dead. We've taken Dernhold, my war chief. Human reinforcements are still leagues distant. Most of those who offered resistance are under our control. The females and their young are unharmed, as you asked. Find me Langston. Hellscream quickly buggered off with those orders, and a short while later returned, with Karamin Langston in tow. You're in command now, I assume? Well, Sergeant... Yeah. Yeah, I am. I have a task for you, then. You and I know what sort of betrayal you and Blackmore were plotting. I'm offering you a chance to redeem yourself. Langston stared up at Thrall and nodded. What would you have me do? Take a message to your alliance. Tell them what happened here. Tell them that if they choose the path of peace, they will find us ready to engage in trade and cooperation, provided they free the rest of my people and surrender land, good land, for our use. If they choose the path of war, they will find an enemy the likes of which they've never seen. You've had the good fortune to survive two battles with my army, Langston, so I'm sure you'll be able to properly convey the full depths of the threat that we pose. Langston's face went pale, and he nodded again. Give him a horse, and provisions. He's to ride unhindered to his betters. I hope for the sake of your people, Langston, that they listen to you. I'll go. Hellscream then grabbed Langston and led him off towards the stables, while Thrall walked off in a different direction. There was one more bloke that he needed to talk to. Sergeant and a small group of men had not quite been subdued yet. They still had their weapons, but they were not actually using them. It was a standoff, where neither side was really doing anything. For a long moment, Sergeant and Thrall regarded one another. And then, quick as a flash, Thrall grabbed Sergeant's earlobe, or rather the earring, piercing it. And then, just as swiftly, Thrall released it, leaving the earring in place. You taught me well, Sergeant. You were a fine student from... Blackmore is dead. Your people are being led away from the fortress and its provisions are being taken as we speak. You taught me the concept of mercy. At this moment, you should be very glad of that lesson. I intend to level Durnhold in a few moments. If your men surrender, they and their families will be permitted to leave. But those that do not surrender will die here, in the rubble. Without this fortress and its knights, the rest of the encampments will fall. That was always my only goal. Was it? Thrall knew that Sergeant was speaking of Blackmore. Justice was my goal, and that has and will be served. Do I have your word that none of my men will come to harm? We do. Immediately, Sergeant and his men dropped their weapons, and with that, the Battle of Durnhold Keep was over. A short while later, once everyone, human and orc, was safely away from the fortress, Thrall had called upon the Spirit of Earth, and was now watching as each and every building of the fortress collapsed. It was cathartic. A lot of painful memories from this place. Thrall then thought of Blackmore. Somewhere in that pile was his body. Until you bury him in your heart, you will not be able to bury him deep enough. You're wise, Drekthar. Perhaps too wise. Was it good to kill him? It needed to be done. He was a poison. Not just to me, but so many. Before I killed him, he... He said that he was proud of me, that I was what he made me. That thought, Drekthar, it appalls me. Of course you are what Blackmore made you. Thrall turned and stared at Drekthar. You want me? And you are what Teresa made you. And Sergeant. And Hellscream. Doomhammer. And I. You are what each battle made you. And you are what you have made of yourself. The Lord of the Clans. Roll credits. Drakthar bowed and walked off, and then Hellscream approached.
Our outriders report that the human reinforcements will soon arrive. We should leave. In a moment. I have a duty for you to perform. Thrall then handed Hellscream a small silver necklace. Find the humans called Fox. Tell them I grieve with them. Hellscream nodded, and he too buggered off. Finally, Thrall took a deep breath, turned his back to the ruins of Durnhold that were his past, and faced towards his future. A sea of green faces. His people, waiting eagerly and expectant. Today, we have won a great victory. We've leveled this mighty fortress, broken its grasp on the encampments. But we cannot yet rest, not whilst many of our brothers and sisters still languish in prisons. We are a proud race. We are undefeatable. Our cause is just. So let us go, to smash their walls and free our people. A huge cheer rose up, and Thrall looked around at the thousands of proud, beautiful orcish faces, filled with joy and excitement. No longer sluggish creatures, sitting in their own shit. It was humbling, really. Thrall, son of Duritan, war chief of the Horde, had inspired each and every one of them to these heights. And after a lifetime of searching, Thrall finally knew where his true destiny lay. He had found his purpose. He'd found family. He'd found home. <laughs>